Hello. So welcome to this session and thank you all for joining. As this is a, womb, a Zoom webinar, you want me to see each other, but we'll, you'll just be seeing the speakers. So the aim of this session is to talk about human rights and pesticide poisoning and pesticide poisoning in the biggest sense. So my name is Michael Edelston. I'm the director of the Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention at the University of Edinburgh. Um, we've been working now for four or five years on the government level regulation of pesticides, trying to remove highly hazardous pesticides from agricultural use to result in particular benefits on suicides and deaths from consuming pesticides. But clearly what I hope will come out in this session is the human rights element of the environmental contamination of the occupational poisoning and the accidental poisoning as well. So it's not purely on suicides. So I'm now gonna turn off my camera and we're gonna watch a film called Tirikiri, Tikiri Banda to set the setting for this session today. This is Sri Lanka's north central province, home to a farming community. The people here have struggled to survive environmental and social pressures since the Green Revolution in the 1960s. For instance, land that was demarcated as elephant corridors was turned into farmlands, making the community vulnerable to attacks from elephants. In addition, the introduction of highly hazardous pesticides created an epidemic of suicides by people harming themselves by drinking it. Biso Manike is a mother of four. Her husband Tikiribanda, a farmer, harmed himself twice by drinking pesticides. Once in 2011 and then in 2019. Luckily, because of the low toxicity of the pesticide he consumed, he survived both these acts. Uh, in the 1980s and 90s, many highly hazardous pesticides were banned in Sri Lanka. It was these legislations that saved Tikiribanda's life. Biso Manika says that they are fearful of the future. Their struggle to make a living while protecting their crops from elephants will not go away anytime soon. But for now, they can rest assured that the pesticides that surround them are much less toxic and will not cause fatal injuries. So the film there very much concentrated on suicides, but clearly HHPs are important for so many other aspects of biodiversity, of occupational harm, and of environmental harm. So we have six fabulous speakers today, some of whom I've never heard before. And I hope you're gonna find this a really interesting session today. Um, here are six speakers. We, uh, two of our speakers are joining us from Asia and are talking very late at night and also have a busy life. So they're gonna join us just for their two talks, this Dr. Shiva and Ms. Rengam. 
We will have uh, questions after those two speakers, just briefly, one or two questions, very focused on their work. And everybody else, the questions will store and we'll keep together as part of a panel at the end of the session. That's how it'll work. We're using the Q&A function, which you can see in the bottom of your Zoom screen, to host those questions. So please put them in there and we will store them and pass, ask the questions at the right time. If you do see that you want to, um, someone suggests a question you also really like, there should be a like function. And if we get lots of people pushing towards one question, clearly that, que that question will get priority. So um, I think now we move to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Marcos Oriana. He's the current UN Special Rapporteur on Toxic and Human Rights. He's an expert in international and global law and on the, glo on the law on human rights and the environment. His practice as a legal advisor has included work with United Nations agencies, governments, and NGOs. He was the inaugural director of the Environment and Human Rights Division of Human Rights Watch. He's also an academic who teaches at the International Environment Law at the George Washington University School of Law. So Marcos, if you'd like to turn on your camera and we really look forward to hearing you. Th thank you, Michael, for the uh, for that introduction. I'm not sure that I'm coming through. Perhaps you could confirm. It's I perfect. Can't see you. Okay, great. We can thank see you, you and we can hear you very well. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you for that introduction. My name is Marco Sorellana. I'm the United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights, and it is my real pleasure to join you uh, in this panel today and to reflect on, on human rights obligations to prevent uh, pesticide exposure. Um, in, in these uh, minutes, I would like to analyze uh, so the normative content of several protected rights. And in order to do that, I'd like to begin first with some general remarks about pesticide exposure and, and the impacts on, on, on human rights. Because exposure to hazardous pesticides worldwide has clear human rights implications. The impacts, they are dire as they are compelling. More than 380 million people poisoned with pesticides every year and fall ill. Diabetes, Parkinson's, infertility, cancer, Alzheimer's. In addition, tens of thousands of people die every year as a result of pesticide exposure. Ex pesticide exposure also causes disabilities, children born with malformations, children suffering impairment of their neurological development. Pesticides are exacerbating the loss of biodiversity. This is a direct threat to food security. And we cannot forget that ecosystem services are the basis of the human economy. All these impacts have adverse effects on a range of protected, internationally protected human rights, such as the right to life and personal integrity, science, health, and a healthy environment. And it is disadvantaged communities, especially in developing countries, that suffer disproportionate impacts on their enjoyment of these rights. Migrant workers in the fields, they are in the front line, often lacking, lacking equipment, often lacking social security. Women in certain periods of their lives are more sensitive to the exposure and the impacts of pesticides, adolescence, pregnancy, lactation, and children. The ILO, the International Labor Organization, estimates that 60% of child laborers work in the agricultural sector, especially in developing countries. These impacts are aggravated by the export of pesticides that are prohibited in their country of origin because of the health and environmental impacts. This is a particularly odious form of discrimination and, in, and exploitation. In addition, the costs of all these impacts are real in health costs, reduced productivity, disabilities, and as I was saying, the costs are disproportionately borne by poor farmers and poor governments in developing countries. These, this situation aggravates 
questions and issues of global environmental injustice. With this prelim these preliminary remarks, I'd like to move to look in further detail at specifics of normative content of what are the human rights obligations that states have in the face of human rights impact. And a first basket of issues that I'd like to take on is the right to life, home life and culture. These rights are protected by the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Two recent decisions by the Human Rights Committee, which is the organ that oversees implementation of the ICCPR, give shape to these rights in the context of the uh, pesticides uh, situation affecting countries worldwide. The Ava Guarani indigenous people in Paraguay, this is a decision dating from a few months ago, October, 2021. The basic facts of the case are the expansion of genetically modified monocultures and pesticide fumigations in violation of internal environmental and other laws and regulations. Children fell ill, waters were polluted, crops were destroyed, fish and animals died, among other impacts. This is a case of omission of state failure to adequately control and prevent contamination. And the Human Rights Committee approached the case through the lens of two protected rights, the right to home life protected in Article 17, and it recent that in the case of indigenous peoples, home life includes natural elements of the indigenous territory, those elements upon which the indigenous peoples rely for subsistence, for the creation, the maintenance of their identity, for their development. The other right that uh, the Human Rights Committee looked at in this case is the right to culture protected in Article 27 of the Covenant. And it reasoned there that the loss of natural resources that are linked to, to subsistence and to cultural practices produces, results in an impairment of, for example, rites of passage, uh, an impairment on other cultural practices, um, an impairment on agroecological practices of the Ava Guarani indigenous peoples. All this leads to a loss of traditional knowledge uh, that uh, compromises the uh, enjoyment of Article 27, um, the right to culture. Among other things, what's interesting in the uh, Human Rights Committee's approach to Article 27 in this case is that it interpreted the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights through the lens of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So we see here a ratcheting up of standards, a harmonious uh, cross-pollinization of instruments and all of this serves to afford protection to the natural elements of the territory of the indigenous peoples that are that is linked to culture. This decision uh, by the Human Rights Committee uh, of October 2021 builds on an earlier decision by the same committee uh, in the case of Portillo Cáceres, also involving Paraguay and also involving the spraying of toxic agrochemicals. In that case, the Human Rights Committee noted the failure of the state to monitor and enforce regulation. So again, a, a, a case of omission, inadequate implementation of obligations. And all of that led in the eyes of the Human Rights Committee to a violation of the right to, a, to life, to a life of dignity and arbitrary interference with home life. So we see in this, in this first basket, a direct connection between pesticide exposure and the right to life, home life and culture under the juris emerging jurisprudence of the Human Rights Committee under the ICCPR. A second right that I, wish to uh, analyze for a few minutes is the right to science. 
Uh, now, this right uh, has often been viewed as the distant cousin in the human rights family, it did not receive much attention for many years. But recently, with, um, the, uh, with a general comment of the Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, that uh, is the organ that oversees uh, uh, implementation and compliance with the International Covenant on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, uh, that's focused on all elements of Article 15, which in the, in the structure of that covenant articulates the right to science or more generally the right to benefit from scientific progress. Uh, I, I uh, devoted my uh, last thematic report to the Human Rights Council on this right, given the concern that I see between the misalignment between scientific evidence and regulatory responses, including in the context of, uh, of, of pesticides. Benefits to society as required by that right do not occur without translation of scientific knowledge into actual policies. But that science policy interface is breaking down. And why is that? Because of attacks against science. This information has become a lucrative business, whether it's for profit or for ideology, we see disinformation taking place in several environmental realms, climate change, plastics, and we also see it in connection with pesticides. Attacks against science is not just about disinformation, severe as that is, it is also attacks against scientists that dare to speak out and voice their concern about the threats facing societies given the exposure to uh, hazardous substances. What are some of the obligations that flow from this right? Well, first of all, the duty to align policy with best available evidence. Uh, as I was saying, often this alignment does not exist because of the reasons stated. Now, at the same time, science is an incremental process uh, that builds knowledge and is not in a position to offer definitive uh, solutions at every time or to every issue. And that's where, in the face of scientific uncertainty, the right to science and the precautionary principle walk hand in hand. So this is a first duty to align policy with best available evidence. A second is to secure the availability and accessibility of scientific information. There are numerous practices where scientific information, scientific studies are withheld from the public domain because of, for example, misunderstood or misapplied confidential business information. Similarly, there is often no penalty for the misrepresentation of science or scientific evidence in regulatory affairs. This is in stark contrast with the penalties that exist in misrepresentation of uh, securities markets, for example, raising questions about why is the right to science offered less levels of protection or lower levels of protection than other public policy issues. Then another duty is the support of inquiry for public benefits. Uh, we often see that the scientific enterprise looks at issues that are of immediate value for the corporations that may derive a patent or other protected intellectual property right. But that is where the right to science encapsulates or promotes the duty to, uh, to secure public benefits. And this has direct and clear implication for pesticides policy. And the last point here is the duty to establish effective science policy interface platforms at the national and international levels. I, I'm very pleased to see the uh, most recent UN Environment Assembly adopting a decision to establish a global science policy interface platform on chemicals, wastes, and pollution. Now, there is real risk, however, in such a platform and of corporate capture, and that's where robust conflict of interest safeguards are indispensable. I see time is running tight, and so I would like to move 
the last right that I'd uh, like to analyze today, which is the right to a healthy environment, uh, which has received a lot of attention in the last couple of months because the Human Rights Council, for the first time in its history in October 2021, adopted a resolution establishing global recognition of this right. Now, this builds on decades of uh, debate, discussion, and jurisprudence on the interface between human rights and the environment. Numerous regional treaties also provide for so, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, the San Salvador Protocol to the American Convention on Human Rights. In that sense, for example, ESCASU, the ESCASU Agreement on Environmental Rights in Latin America and the Caribbean, goes beyond the, its, uh, its uh, sister agreement in Europe, um, the Aarhus Agreement, by establishing a duty of guarantee to the right to a healthy environment. Now, these normative developments call for the question, well, what is the normative content of the right? What does it actually require? And there has been the thesis that it is an umbrella right that encapsulates, brings together the jurisprudence on human rights and the environment. And this jurisprudence can be distilled in participatory rights, of information, participation, remedies, also substantive rights, the right to live in a non-toxic environment. Uh, in collaboration with this UN Special Rapporteur on Environment and Human Rights, David Boyd, uh, we put out uh, last week a report to the Human Rights Council on the right to a non-toxic environment. It focuses on, on sacrifice zones, areas that are so polluted where a life of dignity is uh, difficult, if not impossible. To be sure, where the environment is sacrificed, human rights are sacrificed. These sacrifice zones are a deliberate and systematic denial of human rights. In order to overcome that, the right to a non-toxic environment challenges the content and direction of environmental law, which for so many years and decades, it has focused on managing and controlling and reducing. But the change in paradigm needs to move to prevention and secure to every person a non-toxic environment. A couple other points that I wish to highlight here flow from an advisory opinion by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in, from 2018, where it talks that the content of this right is autonomous. It does not keep, it links with the rights to life, health, physical integrity, but it goes beyond. It has an autonomous, um, it protects the elements of the environment. And in that sense, it links with the rights of nature. Also, that advisory opinion elaborates on the individual and collective dimension of the rights, as I was saying, the connections with other rights in for the individual and also for peoples and communities. And finally, in its most recent contested decision involving this right, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, uh, in the case of Laja Honhatin uh, versus Argentina, Consider that the right is justiciable in the architecture of the American Convention through the provision that protects economic, social, cultural rights. And so it brings in the normative content of ESCR, taking steps, deliberate, focused, targeted towards progressive development, adoption of policies and measures. But what's interesting, perhaps, is that it goes beyond that construct and it talks about the duty to guarantee uh, the right to a healthy environment. And that has immediate effect. It is not to be realized just into the future, but in relation to the rights to life, to personal integrity, exposure to pesticides, for example, involve the duties to respect and to guarantee today, immediately, not out in the future. So in conclusion, Fine, perfect. I'd like to point out, yeah, sorry about the time, uh, that uh, exposure to pesticides can compromise effective enjoyment of a range of human rights, that respect and protection of human rights is critical, and this involves phasing out of highly hazardous pesticides, it involves putting an end to the odious export of prohibited pesticides, for example. So the application of a human rights-based approach to pesticides brings in principles of transparency, participation, accountability, 
but even more so respect for human rights calls for measure to prevent exposure, not to minimize, but to prevent harm. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Marcos. We'll have the questions in the Q&A. If you have a question for Marcos in particular, could you please put his name there? And when we have the panel group at the end, we'll pull out the questions both for the group and for Marcos. So Marcos, we want to take your camera off and go mute. Thank you very much for your time. It was really appreciated. So the next speaker is Dr. Vandana Shiva. Now, few people really working in the field of environmental activity need to know who she is. She is a scientist, an environmental activist, and an author. She's worked to promote biodiversity in agriculture. She's founded the Research Foundation for Science, Technology, and Natural Resource Policy, an organization devoted to developing sustainable methods of agriculture. One notable event in the past is the award of the Right to Livelihood Award in 1993. Now, this is an international award to honor and support those offering practical and exemplary answers to the most urgent challenges facing us today. It's honored courageous change makers since 1980 and aims to boost urgent and long-term social change by recognizing the actions of brave visionaries working for a more just, peaceful, and sustainable world for us all. It's very hard to imagine a more wonderful description of the work that Dr. Shiva's work has been doing, of her work over the last many, many years. Most recently, she's been working with the widows of farmers who have died of suicide to create pesticide-free, debt-free, suicide-free agriculture. Unfortunately, Dr. Shiva is not able to stay with us after her talk. She's busy, it's late, but we're gonna take one or two questions afterwards if you'd like to ask a question. So please put that in the Q&A, put her name first, and I'll invite her to answer those questions very briefly at the end of her session. So Dr. Shiva, thank you very much for being with us today. I'm really looking forward to this. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you to uh, the organizers, to the panelists. Um, my work with pesticides was a bit of a shock because I'd grown up with plants like this. This is the Azadirichta, Melia Azadirichta, its cousin, the Azadirichta indica. We knew that uh, grain, organic grain kept in bins will get best. And my parent, my mother, my grandmother used to put leaves of this in the bin. And it wasn't until 1984, I realized that people were doing that same job in a highly crude and violent way. Um, what woke me up was both an eruption of violence in Punjab, but a disaster on the 2nd of December in 1984 in the city of Bhopal. Uh, I think it is the world's worst industrial disaster. Uh, according to the government statistics, you know, about 3,000 died that night. According to people statistics, about 7,000. More than 25,000 have died since then because of the pesticide leak. It was a plant owned by Union Carbide, which has since then been bought by um, Dow, which has merged with DuPont and has renamed itself Corteva. So you will never find the links to, um, to Bhopal in the history. It's getting erased very, very quickly. It's the women who have kept struggling and particularly amazingly courageous women who were themselves victims like Rashida B and Shukla Ben. And they haven't given up the fight for justice. Women have been particularly impacted by the Bhopal disaster, both in terms of having stillbirths, having infertility, but the disaster to future generations gets carried through women. Now we are living through the third generation of all kinds of impacts and the rapporteur already mentioned the levels of impacts that affect. And till date, there has been no justice for Papa. My next wake up on pesticides was when we were suddenly told, you'll never need to spray pesticides because they are miraculous GMO crops like Bt cotton, which has GMO toxic genes in the plant and is releasing the toxic in the plant itself. And these advertisements will need, never need to spray were very, very false because the pest evolved resistance, new tar non-target pests became massive pests, 
and farmers was praying more. Uh, more than 400,000 farmers have committed suicide in India since globalization and liberalization allowed the deregulation of the seed sector and with it, um, the allowing of the, you know, there's really just four companies that control all the seed of the world and all the agrochemicals of the world, including pesticides. And now that group of five, four is Bayer Monsanto, uh, Corteva, as I mentioned, Syng Syngenta, ChemChina, and BSA. And they began in Hitler's Germany as I, uh, as uh, IG Farben. And I think anyone working on pesticides should be going back to look at the roots of IG Farben. The suicide started because farmers were getting into debt because of the high cost seed, uh, illegal collection of royalties. We've fought many cases on this, false claims that there'll never be need for pesticides. I remember a particular trip I had to rush down to Yavatmal in Vidharba, which has emerged as the capital of farmer suicide because it emerged as the capital of BT cotton. 85% um, of the suicides, if you map the government of India, had statistics maintained district level. And if you map the districts where the BT cotton is growing and the districts where the suicide is, you can do a one-to-one -one map, at least up to 85% of the suicides. The suicides are caused by debt because of the high cost and the failure. And I think what the rapporteur talked about in terms of right to science, I would call it the right to truth. People need the truth about the harm of pesticides, but they all, we also have, we have regulation. The biosafety regulations of the International Convention on Biological Diversity that requires biosafety. And all that is dere being deregulated. Where the regulations are there, they are being dismantled. Where new regulations are needed, like for the second generation GMOs, the CRISPR-based gene edited GMOs, they are being prevented from being put into place. Even though the European Court of Justice said, GMOs are GMOs, it doesn't matter which technique you use to modify a seed or plant at the genetic level. Women are left as the widows. So 400,000 suicides, 400,000 widows. Women don't get into debt. Women were the seed keepers. I work with women seed keepers. As long as the seed is in women's hands, the seed is reliable, seed is pest resistant, seed is nutritious, seed is climate resilient. And the minute you get the commodity seeds, the intellectual property seeds in the market, the men who go to the market are the ones who are convinced with false claims that this is a miracle uh, seed, it's going to make you rich. And I remember the advertisements in the early days about how you're going to be a millionaire. And of course, all the advertisements had American farmers and, um, and Indian farmers will be made to believe that tomorrow they will be living like a Texan farmer, except that the Texan farmers themselves were suffering because of the cost of BT cotton. Debt drives the suicide. And one last time, the farmer goes to borrow from the same money lender, the same agent of the chemical and seed companies, the same people selling the seeds and the toxics, one last bottle of pesticide. And of the many cases I have personally witnessed when I've been in the field is they never commit suicide at home. They always go to their farm, their land, because for the first time they are letting go of this land that has been in their family for 20 generations, 30 generations, and they thought they were taking care of Mother Earth. In some cases, I had seen widows. When I asked them, why did he commit suicide? They'll bring back 30 packets of BT cotton seed. People think they're different seeds, but all the Indian companies are owned by Monsanto's. You know, the Bolgar seed is all Monsanto seed, now buyer seed. I remember a particular public hearing, it was on the 8th of December, 2006. Uh, the farmer unions who've been, you know, protested for about 14 months last year for justice. They had organized this public hearing of widows. There were more than 2,860 widows in Punjab dresses in beautiful color. But this Kurdwara, where the hearing took place and I was called as a jury, was just full of white. All the women were in white. 
and they got up one after the other after the other guruji said her husband and in punjab they don't say drank pesticides they say they drank spray because you spray the pesticide yeah so guruji say Gurjeet's husband, Bud Singh, Baljeet Kaur's husband, Tharil Singh, Karamjeet's husband, Dilwola Singh, Manjeet's husband, Sundar Singh, Gurmeet's husband, Guddu Singh, and the list went on. 2,860 widows. And they are left to bear the burden, not only of the fact that their husband is gone, but worse, their land is gone. Because more often than not, the land is taken away. So women are left without husbands, without land. And so what are we doing with the widows? The first thing is where women still have some land, working with them to get out of the pesticide trap as well as the GMO BT cotton trap. Women used to be the main farmers. Women used to be the main seed keepers and we're helping them remember. I remember a particular year, 2017 it was, when the BT cotton totally failed to control the bollworm. And I had to rush down to Vidarbha. 130 farmers had died with pesticide poisoning. Not just suicide because of death, but actually deaths. 130 died, hundreds were on the top floor of the Yavatmal hospital in emergency care. And the doctor said, we've never seen anything like this. Please do look at the Yavatpal poisoning issue. Women are leading the movement to create a pesticide-free, debt-free, suicide-free farming system. We've been training, and I hope by the end of 2022, we will have 500 women teachers. 500 women teachers who are training others that you don't need pesticides. You can not only grow crops in diversity that control pests, but actually benefit other species, more pollinators, more bees, more yields because of more biodiversity, but also bring back the knowledge of plants like the neem. We have such a rich heritage of traditional knowledge of plants that have been used for controlling pests without killing people or biodiversity. That regeneration of biodiversity, both the knowledge of biodiversity as well as its use, is becoming urgent in a time where we are being made to believe there is no alternative in biodiversity. Biodiversity, in fact, is being reduced since last year, since the Das book, the report, to an asset to be owned by the financial giants, not as the very basis of life, as the basis for alternatives to pesticides. When the Bhopal disaster happened, I remember when we could travel, I went with a whole bucket full of little neem saplings. In those days, Delhi was full of neem trees and we didn't have concrete pavements. So the neem used to drop on the soil and around the neem trees used to be these saplings. I collected all the saplings from the pavements of Delhi, put them in buckets, got onto a train, went to Bhopal and started a campaign no more bhopals, let's plant a neem. For 10 years, everywhere in the country, we taught people how to control pests without pesticides. 10 years later, I find it's been patented. We were being told it's superstition to think neem can control pests. 10 years later, the very same people who were attacking us in the name of science had patented our knowledge. It took us 11 years to fight that case. I organized that, you know, I went through the country, I collected signatures, 100,000 Indians. And we went to the European Patent Office. I also went to the US Patent Office. And the US Patent Office asked, so what's your commercial interest? We said, no, we don't have a commercial interest. We have a life interest. We have a sovereignty interest. And they said, no, we don't entertain anything beyond commerce. Competing commercial interests is all we entertain. Luckily, they're public interest causes in the patent law in the US, so we went in the European law, so we went to the European Patent Office. And I want to be grateful to two other women from the movement. One, Magda Elwet, who then used to be the president of the European Greens, and Linda Bullard, who used to be the president of the International Federation of Organic Movements. With no money, 100,000 signatures, we challenged the US government and W.R. Grace, 
who had the patent on me. It took us 11 years, but eventually a tiny team of women committed to defending truth, defending life, defending safety, defending the future, we won. Of the rights that have been mentioned, the right to life is definitely under threat. The right to safety, as I mentioned, the right to truth. You know, I have had to deal with so much untruth and I am watching how it, it is true that governments are failing, but the government's powers are being eroded by the new culture of deregulation. And we will have to create a new political climate of regulating the harm. Those who commit crimes against nature and people cannot have the freedom to trade in toxic products and go unaccountable for harm. This is the next democratic challenge and women are definitely leading the way. Thank you so much. Dr. Shiva, thank you very much for your presentation. That was fabulous. Now, as mentioned, Dr. Shiva is unfortunately going to leave us to do other things and would love her questions now. So I'm just quickly looking at the Q&A and... Oh, they're both from Marcos at the moment. But so, I mean, I think one of the important things about the pesticide suicide going on in India at the moment is that not only is it the farmers who are suffering, it's, by, it's also their families, their communities, the people who are living in these communities with deeply toxic pesticides available. So when there's the financial stresses affected by the farmer, we then get the individual suicides. But we're probably getting 10 times as many suicides amongst these communities amongst these young people, the children, the grandparents, the school teacher. It's a huge problem within, it, within these communities, which is affecting so many people. It's absolutely true. You know, when I get to these, I would just call them the suicide belt. It is like a permanent mourning. Mm. Yeah. You go down a road and someone runs and says, so-and-so's committed suicide. That house someone's committed suicide. And it is an epidemic. And, you know, because... I'm passionate about truth. I started to do these studies on farmer suicides, not because I was looking for suicides, but they were happening and I wanted to understand. And I realized that farmers had lost their seed, the public sector seed had gone, and the corporations had a monopoly because they had all the Indian seed companies were locked in on a false claim that Monsanto had a patent. It had a US patent, it didn't have an Indian patent. Monsanto cannot take a patent in India. They've lost case after case on the basis of Article 3J of our patent law. But they continue to spread that rumor. And, um, and those suicides then were closely linked to the causality of a debt trap on the false claim that I'm now going to be a millionaire, I'm going to be prosperous. And I think, and we did file a case on misleading advertising. And Monsanto was written to by the Advertising Council. But I think we need much, much, much more convergence of different legal framework. Like I said, the Biodiversity Convention is not being used enough and in fact is being dismembered as I talk with you. And we need movements. I'm very happy right now while we are talking, 1.2 million European citizens have, you know, have built up the campaign on uh, Save Bees and Farmers. And I was patron of launching this campaign, I think two years before the COVID disaster. But I think we need many grassroots movement. We need a lot of scientific word to be made visible and linked to policy. But most importantly, we need a convergence of all the frameworks. And together, those frameworks have to be protected while they are there and strengthened. I'm gonna ask you one more brief question that someone's asked, asked us. Dr. Shiva, how, uh, how can rights laws be used to protect women from pesticide exposure and poisoning? Do you have a simple answer for that yet? It sounds a complex question to me. Yeah. How no, can I rights law protect women? Yeah, I think wherever there's a human life involved, and you know, the world talks a lot about gender rights. Well, the problem is we normally stop at the shallow level. We don't go deeper. And the mm -hmm. minute we become far more creative in seeking the rights that are in our constitutions, the rights that are in our, you know, the states and local council are very strong on health rights, particularly in Europe, I've seen. So how do women's rights in, in 
in the face of protection on the harm from pesticides get used, the women's movement has to connect it much more deeply. You know, we, we've kind of ignored, even though the original women movement was my body, myself, we've kind of ignored the material threats coming from the toxic regime. And I would add, you know, as, as someone who has done a lot of the writings on this is, you know, I've seen the, the, the very birth of pesticides and this expansion into agriculture as part of a whole militaristic way of looking at the world. Every insect's an enemy, every plant is an enemy, must be killed with a roundup. And there is other ways of looking, the indigenous views that were presented and how they've been be, be mobilized and law. Those views have to be start, ha have to start giving substance to rights laws. And mm -hmm. I want to tell you that the person who really fought the Bhopal case is dear Indira Jai Singh, a mm -hmm. leading woman rights lawyer, a leading human rights lawyer, and was part of our issue. I think she was our assistant attorney general. So, and she's the one who constantly interprets laws at the deeper level where they need to be interpreted with the new threats that are coming, not just of pesticides, but pesticide resistant GMO crops. Thank you very much indeed Thank for you. spending some time with us today. It was a real delight. Have a lovely evening meeting after us. And thank you. Thank you, for your you time. so much for a safe Bye -bye. world. Thank you. Thank you. So my, the next speaker is Sarah Jenny Rengam. So Sarah Jenny is the exec executive director of Pan Asia Pacific. And Pan Asia Pacific is one of the five regional centers of the Pesticide Action Network, which is a global network of many tens or hundreds of NGOs working to reduce or eliminate the harm upon humans and the environment like caused by pesticide use. She's a trained zoologist, and she's also one of the initiators of the Asian Rural Women's Coalition and the People's Coalition for Food Sovereignty. Now, again, Sarajini is joining us very late from Malaysia, and so she will be leaving after her talk. So again, we'll have a time for a couple of questions at the time, which I'll pick out and invite and ask. And thank you very much for joining us, and we're looking forward to this immensely. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the uh, organizers for this opportunity to share some of the uh, work that we've been doing, as well as, uh, you know, some um, uh, thoughts on uh, moving uh, towards a pesticide-free world. So I'll share my uh, presentation. Okay. Um, Can you see this? Oops, it's in the wrong, okay. Yes, that's perfect. We can hear you and we can see that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, one of the uh, key points I wanted to make was uh, that pesticide poisonings, as Marcus was talking about, uh, is a global human right concern. And, uh, you know, and, and Marcus also mentioned that uh, we are seeing, you know, around uh, 385 million farmers and workers each year suffering from pesticide poisoning. And these are cases of unintentional acute pesticide poisonings each year. In the meantime, we have the global pesticide market that has doubled in the last 20 years um, with about uh, 60 billion uh, in 2020, and it's expected that uh, about 2 million tons of pesticides are ut utilized annually uh, worldwide. And behind each of these cases uh, are the human costs and sufferings of uh, people who are poisoned uh, because of uh, exposure to pesticides. Uh, again, the uh, kind of uh, chronic effects um, from acute uh, poisoning, we have cancers, we have asthmas and allergies, uh, reproductive disorders and abnormalities, obesity, diabetes, and neuro neurodevelopmental and behavioral disorders and birth defects as, you know, as the uh, consequence uh, of uh, and the impact of pesticides. Uh, certain pesticides that uh, have shown to cause uh, these uh, impacts. Uh, 
whilst we also have been seeing uh, environmental impacts of pesticides, and these are accumulative uh, for, you know, for the four to five decades of pesticide use, we are seeing declining bee populations that pose a threat to global agriculture. So one treated corn seed contains enough neocotinoids to kill 80,000 honeybees, more than 80,000 honeybees. We have bird populations that have declined 20 to 25% because of pesticides. These are loss of biodiversity, 75% of loss of flying insects, and this was documented in Germany. We have waterways that are contaminated and loss of aquatic life. Uh, widespread contamination and loss of soil biodiversity. And all of this is actually leading uh, to economic, uh, sorry, ecosystem disruption and loss of ecosystem services, um, include, including biological controls. In Asia, you know, uh, some of the, the documentation that we have been doing as part of the uh, community pesticide action monitoring is to see how pesticides are used. And here, I just wanted to share some uh, uh, photos of what's happening on the ground. These are pesticides being, you know, sprayed uh, in a rice uh, growing uh, communities. These are farmers, uh, women, children that are being exposed uh, while the pesticide spring is uh, going on. Uh, we had uh, documentation in, uh, in 2018 and 2019 where uh, we were able to document 10 farmers suffering, uh, 10, uh, sorry, seven out of the 10 farmers interviewed suffering from acute pesticide poisoning. And uh, in 2019, we were able to document in India, in Andhra Pradesh, in the mango uh, growing uh, areas, uh, a few farmers and workers who have been spraying pesticides having uh, suffering from blindness. And this uh, young uh, uh, child, uh, girl, uh, Simran, uh, was playing in the uh, mango orchard while her grandmother was spraying uh, pesticides in the mango orchard. And then she suffered uh, by losing one uh, eye. And, and, you know, so there's blindness uh, happening even in, the, uh, in other countries as well. But this was something that we were able to document in Andhra Pradesh in the mango growing areas. Uh, this is Paraquat, uh, a bit shocking because Paraquat is one of the most highly hazardous pesticides. One teaspoon, uh, if ingested, will kill you with, and there's no antidote and it's being sold in polythene bags in India. This was recent, but we also found this in Indonesia uh, a few years back. And, uh, you know, these are uh, pesticides, highly hazardous pesticides that are being sold without any kind of precautions, labels, or, you know, um, and, and people are just using it uh, without understanding what, what uh, this uh, can cause. Majority of farmers uh, interviewed have also say, are saying that uh, not only farmers, but also workers, that they do not use uh, personal protective equipment, uh, either uh, because it's too uh, unavailable, too, too expensive, or it's too hot uh, in our climate, which is hot and humid. And so uh, it was, it's very difficult to use these PPE. And so, uh, majority of farmers do not use PPE. We also have this health and environmental concerns. This is just a snapshot, but everywhere you go in the rural areas, people, um, farmers are just, you know, uh, after using pesticides, they are, they are just uh, discarding it in the fields. Um, and so Vietnam tried to put this uh, uh, cement uh, kind of uh, bins uh, made from cement for them to throw uh, these packages, but now they don't know what to do with the packages, uh, and in, and the bins are filled up, and so uh, they have no solution. So these are some of the the problems that uh, you know we are facing in terms of uh, health and environmental concerns. And this is Paraquat that has basically you know uh, was sprayed on this field with uh, 
and it's everything is dyed there. Um, and and uh, and that's the reality of a lot of the uh, farms happening uh, that when when herbicides and weed control are used. This is kind of uh, a bit sad because these are pesticide packages, and uh, uh, you know, uh, and what has been what has happened is that they have used these packages to to um, uh, pack. Uh, cakes for children, and this was sold in the uh, near the schools and in retail shops uh, in Cambodia. And it was, and it caused the the pesticide poisoning uh, of few children. And uh, it was taken off, but you know, um, wherever people found it, they kind of threw it away. But it's still a major uh, a problem uh, in terms of repackaging. Uh, or uh, using the packages uh, and containers, pesticide containers, they reuse it for water containers, even you know some um, ways to to make uh, uh, toys, etc. So the the exposure uh, of children is quite uh, there uh, when you have these kinds of uh, reality on the ground in terms of uh, the reuse of packaging and uh, you know, bottles and uh, what you call containers uh, of pesticides. This was a snapshot also because there was, uh, Pan EP had uh, launched, uh, you know, uh, protect our children from toxic pesticides. Uh, and this was uh, a group in Cambodia that had tried to work with the school uh, in one area, a primary school. And you can see that the primary school is surrounded by uh, farmers, uh, rice farms. And so they started a campaign uh, where they were able to uh, talk to the teachers, the, the parents, the uh, children to, uh, you know, basically reduce their exposure to pesticides. And so they also talked to the farmers around uh, to, you know, uh, reduce their pesticide use uh, and not spray to, when the children are in school. So they, they are trying to have a uh, um, a training and a um, exchange so that the farmers can move away from pesticide use. And it's a slow process, but uh, it's a campaign that, you know, uh, we are hoping that there would be more uh, groups, more companies, uh, sorry, schools and more uh, farmers who would be able to uh, slowly change uh, to a pesticide free, uh, you know, and, and be, uh, have buffer zones around schools um, in, in rural Asia. This was a, a study that was done with uh, children in uh, both the uh, floriculture and the one that you saw was in the mango orchards, but this was uh, looking at 20, uh, 25 uh, children who were, uh, flori they were actually uh, child laborers doing um, plucking flowers in the floriculture industry. And they are exposed to pesticides because there's no, um, uh, when, when the pesticides are sprays, sprayed, uh, the children go in after that and they're exposed. And a lot of them have been uh, complaining about pesticide exposure. Uh, either they have headaches, rashes, vomiting, insomnia, tremors and fatigue. And, some actually are so uh, tired uh, that they can't go to school after that. Uh, and these are some of the pesticides that are being used in the, um, in the uh, floriculture industry. And um, basically it's uh, uh, highly hazardous uh, pesticides. Um, as uh, I think, you know, this was quite, uh, quite, uh, um, part of our campaign, but it was really a bit scary because we have 108 uh, million children engaged in agriculture and UNICEF is very clear to say that many of these children uh, or most of these children are regularly working in the fields during or following the spring season when levels of pesticide residues are high. And children, of course, have four to five times the amount of toxins uh, from a given source uh, being absorbed uh, compared to adults. And uh, you will be hearing uh, Basfur uh, Tunchak 
where he came out with a report where he described the silent pandemic of disability and disease associated with child exposures to toxics and pollution and explaining the obligations of states and the responsibilities of businesses and uh, enterprise enterprises to protect such um, uh, exposure. Then we have, uh, these are the list of, uh, sorry, uh, com this was part of CPAM, uh, and this was the list of highly hazardous pesticides that we found in four countries, in four communities in Asia in 2021. And that's quite a lot of pesticides that are being used in these countries. And a lot of them are also banned in other countries. Um, and so we, we are also using uh, banned pesticides in, in Asia uh, in those countries. So these are some of the pesticides again. I won't go uh, into it because of time, but I just wanted to also highlight the double standard. And I think the double standard is rampant at the country level and with big transnational corporations. And Pan Germany found that as of 2017, uh, Germany exported nine pesticides which are not approved for use in the EU, EU including pesticides cyanamide, acetochlor, deproloxidin which are listed by the EU as carcinogenic and toxic to reproduction. And these are uh, pesticides that are being sent to the developing uh, countries. And you can see from the picture that the way that we, you know, it's being used, again, it's uh, quite uh, horrendous because there's no PPE, there's no uh, awareness, there's no training, there's no uh, understanding of these pesticides are poisons. And in another study by Public Eye, uh, according to estimates in 2017, 51 of the 120, pes uh, 120 pesticide active ingredients in Syngenta's portfolio are not authorized for use in its home country, Switzerland. And recently, uh, you heard from um, uh, Wandana, who talked about Yabatmal. And one of the pesticides called Polo or Diphenpurion uh, caused the pesticide poisoning of more than five, uh, 54 that was documented by public eye, 54 farmers and workers who were hospitalized, 51 out of the 54 were hospitalized by, uh, with, severe, uh, with severe symptoms. And two, uh, according to police records, also uh, died because of polo, which is the uh, Syngenta's um, brand for Diphenpyrion. Anyway, this is ongoing. There's a, a court case happening in Switzerland and there's an OECD uh, complaint that has been put forward. Um, I just wanted to just highlight uh, the, uh, who profits from this. And here the, uh, very clearly the agrochemical uh, TNCs, 70% uh, of the top five, uh, top four uh, companies actually control 70% of pesticides. And this is Syngenta, Bayer, um, BSF, and Cortiva, uh, which as uh, Vandana said, you know, it's a merger of Dow and DuPont, and now it's Cortiva. Anyway, I think Michael is uh, kind of saying I'm running out of time. I just wanted to highlight that, uh, you know, we are having a campaign also where FAO and CropLife have this toxic alliance and CropLife is the association of all these big uh, transnational uh, corporations selling poisons, uh, the four that I mentioned and others. Uh, and FAO has this alliance with CropLife and we, we are calling FAO to stop uh, this toxic alliance. And just wanted to highlight that agroecology, which is a, a method practice movement uh, science is actually the viable um, uh, alternative uh, to pesticide use. You don't need pesticides if you have agroecology. And uh, you know, thousands of uh, farmers, even women uh, in Asia, are, are basically practicing uh, these uh, methods, and they're very happy. <laughs> they are, uh, you know, fulfilled, and they are saying that, uh, you know, this is possible, please don't use pesticides. So I'll stop here. Um, I think I'm running out of time. Thank you.
Not at all. Thank you very much indeed for your fascinating talk. I have one question for you. Sh uh, short question, difficult answer. So a, a brief answer from yourself. What, in your opinion, should governments do to protect children from exposure to highly hazardous pesticides? What should governments do? Yes, uh, I think that's very clear. They have to ban these highly hazardous pesticides. They have to, in the first, um, you know, kind of uh, basically uh, ban this with a, a possibility of moving uh, and supporting farmers to move towards agroecology. I think it's uh, it's sometimes uh, uh, difficult to uh, move uh, farmers, you know, because they are in this treadmill uh, of debt and uh, difficulties. Uh, they, they are in this uh, um, kind of addiction, actually, because once you remove this highly hazardous pesticides, you will find that it takes a bit of time to move towards agroecology. And most farmers are... Uh, have this opportunity to, you know, basically move towards agroecology if they have the support, if they have the research, if they have the the training, even exchanges with other farmers to move to move towards agroecology. In the meantime, uh, I think we need to create, uh, you know, kind of create buffer zones around uh, schools uh, as a way forward. Uh, I think that's that's very clear. And then at the global level, I think we need to have a global mechanism to kind uh, to move towards a phase out of highly hazardous pesticides globally, and uh, with the with a kind of incentive and support for developing countries to move towards agroecology. I think that's the way forward, um, and also to protect biodiversity in the long run. Uh, all this will have an impact. Um, as well as, you know, it, it's good for the climate uh, and, you know, mitigation and adap adaptation is possible with uh, agroecology. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for staying up so late. I hope we don't stay up wide awake now for the next two hours, all excited <laughs> after all the talks. Yeah, I hope you get to sleep. You. And thank you very much for joining us so late. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Not at all. So our next speaker is Baskut Tunkak. Uh, he's the director of the Toxic Use Reduction Institute, where he leads the organization's effort to advance safer and healthier environments and workplaces, particularly in the United States and in the state of Massachusetts. He's the former Special Rapporteur on Toxic and Human Rights from 2014 to 2020. He's an attorney and a chemist, and he specialized in toxic pollution rates matters. He's worked in some activist lawyer companies in London, some, some very famous legal companies, and actually the thing I found quite interesting recently, he's almost like a rock star. You mentioned you know this person, people get very excited about that. He's very well known in legal circles and has made a really huge impact with his role as the UN Rapporteur over the last decade. And uh, it's very exciting to have you speaking with us today, Bus Baskud, thank you very much for sparing us the time. Thank you, Michael. That's a very kind introduction. Um, good morning or good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be part of this exciting panel. Um, the, the presentation so far has been excellent. Um, let me just pull up my presentation real quick. Can you all see my screen now? Sorry, yes, it's very clear. You're clear and the, and the screens are clear. Wonderful. Uh, well, hello again, um, and, and thank you again for, for the invitation to participate. Uh, this has uh, truly, truly been an, an inspiring uh, set of presentations. Uh, I wanted to, to speak a little bit about uh, what a few of the presenters had, had touched upon already, which is the situation of states exporting uh, chemicals that are prohibited from use uh, domestically to, to foreign, uh, foreign jurisdictions. And, and this, this issue actually um, touches upon the, the very foundation of, of the mandate uh, that Marcos holds on uh, human rights and toxics uh, that I held and, and before me, uh, several other uh, individuals held, uh, which is the, the export of waste. The, the mandate originated around the issue of toxic waste exports uh, back in the mid 90s. And when we, when we look at the definition of, of waste, we find that it's, um, 
it's it's been a contentious issue, so to speak. Uh, there have been some some very progressive definitions, good definitions, such as in the Bamako Convention uh, of the of the African Union. However, uh, when we look at the plain language definition, what we see uh, oftentimes is unwanted, and and in my view, this is really what what we're looking at when it comes to these chemicals that continue to be exported. Um, to countries, uh, oftentimes to countries that, that lack adequate uh, systems and controls and safeguards uh, for, for their use. Um, and, and oftentimes at, at far, uh, far lower levels of, of safety uh, than, than the, the countries which have said that these chemicals actually cannot be used uh, with any reasonable certainty of, of safety and protection. Um, <clears throat> so during during my 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 tenure as a special rapporteur, I had the the privilege of of traveling and, and meeting with communities uh, that have faced numerous toxic threats uh, to their human rights. But uh, almost invariably during during my trips, I would speak with victims of of pesticide exposure. And and throughout throughout the course of my mandate. Pesticides have, have been a, a recurring uh, theme. In, in 2016, I had the opportunity to collaborate with the former special rapporteur on the right to food, Gilal Elver, uh, and we worked on a report looking at the right to food and pesticides and how pesticides throughout their life cycle uh, infringe on, on the right to food, uh, as well as a host of other rights uh, through their use in, in food and agricultural production. Um, these, the stories that I heard um, were, were quite grave. Uh, one, one in particular sticks with me, which is uh, in Brazil, when, when I met with some Afro-Brazilian communities, uh, a lady stood up and, and said that uh, the farmers are, are using chemical weapons on us to drive us from our lands. And, and no one is coming to help us. And, and this, this really stuck with me. Um, it was. Uh, certainly uh, a tragic case of, of a community that was repeatedly being exposed to toxic, toxic pesticides uh, without the information about which pesticides are being used, uh, but seeing a, a very a wide variety of, of health impacts amongst the community, including their children. Um, in other visits, I also heard from teachers uh, who said that they had to suspend class because the children uh, were, were unable to breathe, after having been exposed to pesticide drift that came into their school, uh, which should be a safe place, a place of learning. Um, and then numerous other, other cases as well, uh, including cases involving uh, intentional and accidental pesticide poisonings. When, when we look though at, at which pesticides were, were being implicated in those cases that I would come across, uh, what I would often see is that the pesticides were uh, banned by, by many countries around the world. Uh, and, and so, for example, in, in Brazil, uh, the cases that we would come across would involve the pesticide paraquat, uh, which, which Saro mentioned just before me. Um, and and these, these pesticides were often highly hazardous pesticides banned in other countries, uh, but continue to be exported. Uh, around the world. And here we have uh, a great graphic that was produced by Public Eye and Unearth just, just a few years ago, uh, which looked at some of the data that has been compiled by the European Chemical Agency. And there you can see uh, the, the status of various European Union members uh, or former members in the case of the, the primary exporter, United Kingdom. Um, and, and there, their export um, statistics. And, and certainly uh, Paraquat stands out, uh, manufactured and exported by Syngenta uh, to various countries. Uh, while the US is one of the primary importing countries, we can see that many low and middle income countries are on the receiving end of, of these toxic exports. Um, in, in my view, this is one way in which the, the international regime uh, but as well as the national regime has institutionalized uh, 
the externalities of consumption and production that we have today, uh, especially in low and middle income countries. Uh, because while Europe has strengthened its, its regulation of pesticides, what to a level that some would say is uh, among the strongest in the world, uh, the most protective, uh, it has left open a, a gaping loophole which, which allows companies to continue to manufacture and export pesticides uh, to countries uh, such, as, uh, such as Morocco, such as uh, Chile, South Africa, the Russian Federation, Vietnam, Peru, <laughs> India, and Canada, among others, uh, where there are questionable records of, of protection when it comes to, to pesticide protection. Um, <clears throat> So in, in the case of, of Paraquat, uh, Saro mentioned a few of the, the risks, including from acute poisoning, uh, but also it's increasingly linked to, uh, to health impacts from chronic exposure, such as Parkinson's, uh, lung damage, respiratory disease, DNA and cellular damage. Um, Par Paraquat was among 20, 29 substances that the, the, the Indian government looked at uh, in in considering a petition that was based on the right to life where India continued to use pesticides that had been banned uh, in, in foreign jurisdictions. And, and Paraquat was, was among uh, the, that cohort of uh, several dozen. And what, what I found interesting was, was how the committee, this uh, scientific committee uh, reviewed the evidence of, of Paraquat, which was quite cursory in my view. Uh, essentially, after the first round uh, where they prioritized chemicals for review, uh, they did dismiss the, the concerns about Paraquat, saying that it was largely uh, an issue of misuse and that the, um, the, the, the relevant chem chemical manufacturers had, had explained the situation with Paraquat, its, uh, its quote unquote safety, and, and they, they thanked the, the interventions from the industry and refused to consider Paraquat further in their deliberations. Uh, those deliberations eventually resulted in, in many of those pesticides being uh, unauthorized for use or banned, but, but Paraquat continues to be used. Um, and recently in India, there was uh, uh, news reports that in Odisha, uh, over 200 people have, have recently uh, died from pesticide exposure, acute pesticide exposure, uh, uh, epidemic of, of, of paraquat poisoning. And, and this sort of evidence uh, apparently was never considered by India. Uh, and yet the governments uh, such as the United Kingdom continue to, to export paraquat to, uh, to countries like India without conducting uh, any, any reasonable investigation of, of what the human rights impacts are. And, and this is actually quite contrary to the, to the plain language of, of statutes in the United Kingdom that call for, um, for, for prohibitions on exports or controls on exports where uh, there are uh, impacts on human rights. Another case uh, that I wanted to bring up involves uh, the, uh, the situation in Sonora, Mexico. Uh, which was reviewed by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in, I believe, 2015. Um, there in, in Sonora, Mexico, uh, an indigenous community has uh, been on the receiving end of banned pesticide exports for many years from the United States. Uh, and on the right, you can see children in one part of the community where, where pesticides were used, uh, the valley, and, and uh, the drawings of children on the left where pesticides were not used. And uh, this is, I think, a very clear illustration of what the developmental impacts are on children who are exposed to highly hazardous pesticides. The, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, considered this request in part of, as part of their review of, of Mexico uh, and, and recommended that, that Mexico stop importing pesticides that are banned uh, from use in the countries in which they are manufactured and eventually exported. Now, this, 
fortunately, there have been growing efforts in addition to that, that example uh, of the statement by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, to further curb the export of these banned pesticides and other industrial chemicals. Uh, there was a, a statement that came out in 2020 uh, by myself and, and other uh, current and former special rapporteurs calling on states to stop exporting these unwanted toxic chemicals. Uh, this followed actually a, a uh, decision by the French Constitutional Court to uphold uh, a ban uh, that was enacted in France on the export of such chemicals, uh, which was a very positive step. And that was subsequently followed uh, after our intervention by the European Union, who as part of their new chemical strategy for sustainability, pledged that it would ensure that hazardous chemicals banned in the European Union are not produced for export. And, and that's uh, wonderful language, uh, but to my knowledge that that decision still has yet to be uh, fully implemented. And with that, I, I just wanted to say that this, this issue, um, I think of, of toxic chemicals, uh, toxic materials that continue to be exported uh, with limited controls is, is one of the, the most pressing issues when it comes to our progression on toxic pollution as a global, global threat. Uh, states, states and businesses have continued to be able to externalize these impacts on vulnerable communities all around the world. And without a global response, uh, as Sara was mentioning, and, and Marcos before her, a, a truly global response that helps to elevate the, the baseline, the playing field for all. Um, it would be very difficult, I think, to make a truly global transition towards a uh, safer, healthier uh, environment for all. So thank you. Thank you very much, Basquiat. That was really nice. And I look forward to asking questions in the session of the panel when we're asking questions to the four of you. So thank you for your time. And our next speaker is a colleague of mine from South Africa. Her name is Andrea Rother. She's the head of the Environmental Health Division in the School of Public Health and Family Medicine, at University of Cape Town. She's an environmental health specialist. She's been involved in national and international policy development around reducing chemical and pesticide health and environmental health risks, an area she's been working in very influentially for the last 25 years. I've seen her many times in action on the joint meeting on pesticide management, where she intellectually leads 95% of our discussions. So it's really exciting to have you here, Andrea. Thank you for sparing the time. We look forward to hearing about your work and your ideas. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, and I really appreciate being a part of this dynamic um, panel and this important session. Uh, so it's really nice to follow on with others who have already laid quite a lot of groundwork of looking at the issue of- um, Andrea, your slides oh, sorry. up, it's just on your screen. If you make it um, as in, what's it called? When you show a slideshow, perfect. Thanks. You're very Thank clear, you. you can see. Sorry about that. Great. Thank you. So um, looking at this sort of concept of um, pesticide, poisoning prevention. And, and as I said, there has been a lot of groundwork that has been laid already by my colleagues on highlighting the issues of pesticide poisoning. Uh, I was reflecting on the, you know, where so much of the knowledge base began with Rachel Parsons' Silent Spring uh, in 1962, you know, where she laid the groundwork for um, highlighting globally really to uh, pesticide poisoning issues, both for human health and the environment. And then I thought about how now in 2021, uh, Johann Zeller has published this book called Daily Poison, Pesticides and Un Underestimated Danger, and really questioning why 59 years later, are the same issues still being discussed and highlighted, the human rights issues, the human rights violations, the poisonings, uh, and the need for stronger re uh, regulation. And it's a complex response to you know, looking at you know, the right to reduce exposure to pesticide risk. Uh, and I'm going to really just focus on one aspect of it. Many aspects have already been highlighted by my um, previous colleagues who've just spoken. But if we look at, you know, that, and we reflect on the fact that all pesticides 
are toxic. They're meant to be toxic. Uh, but the risk only comes in when there is an exposure. And so how there's a need then to reduce this exposure, but in order for that to happen, really the, it, this needs to be, the evidence needs to be, um, the exposure needs to be evident as well as understood. And looking at the aspect of how we unpack understanding uh, the risks associated with exposures to pesticide hazards, is looking at the, the access to information, so the right to know, uh, the means of actually understanding this information once you have access to it. So what I refer to as the right to comprehend and how the message is transmitted, so through the pesticide label. And these are the three components that I'm going to look at um, in my talk today. Although important is also to take into account the message itself, and who's providing the information. And just to note, I do a lot of research on street pesticides, which of course are unlabeled products, but I'm going to focus on the aspect today of really uh, pesticides that are being labeled. So if we look at the right to know, uh, in the 1990s, it um, became a fundamental right in many um, constitutions, uh, many legislations around the world, over 60 countries have got some form of uh, right to know within their legislation. But unpacking this right to know, it does exclude certain things. And uh, Vandana rightly spoke about this, um, the right to truth and the lack sometimes of transparency. So if we look at pesticides, for example, you can have access to the active ingredient on the pesticide label. But for the most part, um, the inerts, the coformulants, the surfactants are not required by law to list, be listed on the, the label. And so what happens then is um, the health professionals or the um, first responders in an accident will uh, have access to what the active ingredient is, but not perhaps what some of the other products are within the pesticide that could be causing uh, some of the health risks. So when you look at the aspect of the right to know, so talking about access to information and then the complexity of what I was just highlighting is, is some of not all the information is forthcoming. But if we move beyond that, that access to information is not enough, that there also needs to be other mechanisms in order to understand what that information means in order to really action protective behavior. And in most cases, there is no legislation that brings in this concept of the right to comprehend. So uh, that there is a requirement that information be explained in a way that is understandable to a broad range of target audiences. So for example, the pictograms on the right-hand side, uh, you will see um, are on many of the pesticide labels in low and middle income countries but these are often not explained. And the assumption is that they're intuitively obvious. And so then what happens is this concept of um, blaming the end user for poisoning. So talking about misuse or that um, farmers, or farm workers are ignorant and therefore that's why pesticide poisonings are occurring. If we look at the complexity of um, trying to understand the information that has been provided, so building on the right to know. The right to comprehend has different trajectories. So the right to comprehend information for policymakers or decision makers is around the risk assessment data or the research data. How do you understand the science in order to action uh, policy? And then there's the public and workers and the data that is uh, information is provided to them, it, often in the form of labels or safety data sheets. And I'm just going to give the example of labels uh, and not look at the policymakers today. So if you look at uh, the pesticide label, particularly in low and middle income countries, uh, the idea is to have these risk communication tools on there. So you'll see there are four color bands or color codes uh, that have been provided and the question then is, well, what do these mean? Uh, they're meant to be intuitively obvious for low literate populations. Uh, they should be able to understand what these four colors mean, whether it's for acute toxicity or chronic toxicity, uh, and then what safety behavior to implement. 
The reality, though, of these color codes, which are based on the WHO hazard classification of acute toxicity, is that in most countries, they're either not noticed or they're not understood. And if they are understood, then it's very difficult uh, for people to know what to do and how to action them. So that the red is the most toxic and what type of protective equipment to be worn, then um, the yellow being the next toxic, as well as then the blue and the green. And the industry has been quite clever, as you can see with the uh, pictures at the bottom of the screen, that sometimes the color code actually melts into the packaging, so it doesn't draw attention as with the Ratix and the Doom. And other times, uh, for example, more recently in South Africa, they've been selling these red labeled um, bin, uh, um, rubbish bin fillers with uh, organophosphates in it, and people not being aware of what the red label means, that these are neurotoxins. So the, the question then becomes, well, what is the purpose of the, the pesticide label? Is it actually a, a right to know tool? Is it really um, providing uh, risk information in order to implement a safety uh, change? Or is it protecting industry from liability? Being able to say it was on the label, but the end user misused it. More recently, there's been an attempt with the globally harmonized system for the classification and labeling of pesticides, uh, sorry, of chemicals, to bring in um, information, hazard information, and on the labels that is linked to chronic hazards. So you can see on the left, the exploding man is now the, the latest pictogram that will be or is already on many um, labels uh, and products throughout Europe. It's coming more um, recently now into low and middle income countries. It's only been recently promulgated in South Africa. And the idea is that this is supposed to then transmit uh, complex chronic health messages. So the, there'd be a signal word underneath this same warning, and then there could be different types of precautionary statements. I pulled out one of them that was linked to uh, reproductive toxicity, which would be listed under this pictogram, saying suspected of damaging fertility for the unborn child. And these are complex concepts in English or in perhaps the official languages within a country that then a worker is supposed to interpret and in how to protect it. But you can see we have tried through complex means to come up with uh, simplistic ways of saying what is a pesticide residue, uh, which you can see are the little skull and crossbones, and what are the results of being uh, wearing the incorrect uh, PPE and possibly having exposure. But there is no requirement that these types of um, methods for explaining risk are in legislation. And so what happens then, as I mentioned already, that you have then this concept um, of blaming the end user for poisonings. So uh, often you'll hear people saying, and it has been referred to, you know, the misuse of pesticides. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen, there's this document in the US where it's the misuse of pesticides causes ill health. Uh, but there's no clear definition of what misuse means. I've done an extensive search within looking at different legislation, trying to see if you can find what it means. And it's only the US EPA that refers to misuse violations uh, in terms of inconsistent use or application uh, different from what is state, stated on the label. So it's a, a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. And again, misuse then is reliant on the individual being able to uh, understand the label, have access to it, understand it, and then being able to implement some safety behavior change. And so in the research that um, I conducted, I was able to identify that there are five factors that would have to be achieved concurrently if misuse really was uh, going to occur or could uh, occur. And these five factors are access to the label, so the right to know. It needs to be on a package, it needs to be readable, it needs to be in the appropriate language, so the label must be in the language of the end user. Uh, in South Africa we have 11 official languages and our labels are predominantly in two, Afrikaans and English, occasionally in Zulu. Uh, 
It also has to be at a level of reading that the individual can understand. So often the pesticide label will say, um, wash your eye out with copious amounts of water. Um, how much is copious amounts? What type of water? Should it be running water? Should it be from a bowl? Uh, needs to be very clear. And then there needs to be um, an, an, a literacy level, being able to understand technical, uh, complex language that's on the, the label in order to have then the right to comprehend. And then finally, you need to actually have the equipment and facilities that are mentioned on the label to prevent exposures. Does the individual actually have access to that? So looking at the literature to see what um, constitutes misuse of um, pesticides in the literature, you can see there's a, a long list of uh, people would refer to it as incorrect mixing or lack of compliance with application instructions or spraying too soon from harvesting. Then there's this one of mishandling, uh, not wearing the correct PPE, where you can see you would have to have all five factors that I just listed uh, in order to truly meet this requirement of mishandling. So in implementing the right to comprehend, to promote um, pesticide poisoning prevention, we really need to ask the question of who's responsible for actioning the right to comprehend. So we have legislation on the right to know, we have legislation that says the pesticide um, the legal pesticides have to have a label on them. There is specification of what needs to be on the label. But who's responsible for making sure that this information is understood as scientifically intended and that the means are there to be able to also action the safety behavior? So legislating it would be a first step to promoting a rights-based approach to pesticide risk management. But then realistically, one also needs to take into account that these mechanisms for ensuring the right to comprehend are costly to develop them, uh, time consuming, uh, I'll show you in a minute, uh, and also that they require extensive means of disseminating them and disseminating them to uh, across the board to target audiences, it's uh, target end users. It's not just farmers and farm workers exposed to pesticides, it's all of us. And so it requires whether you have extra text on the, the labels or posters sold where the pesticides, um, posters placed where the pesticides are sold or training and how do you train the public. So here is uh, some examples of the materials that we have developed. Uh, the bottom right-hand corner one took two years to develop with a broad range and team of people. Uh, the stickers uh, also took quite some time to develop. And then it's distribution and putting them in the other uh, relevant languages. One thing would be to require that the um, industry has to provide this information, that legally you, uh, it be included with all packaging, but there's still no guarantee that the comprehension would occur as intended or that there would be a behavior change as needed. So one of the things that the industry has done is focused on responsible use and safe use of pesticides in order for um, promoting their own uh, focus on pesticide poisoning prevention. And the responsible use really focuses on, again, being able to read the label and the color codes. And, and it takes us back then to the five factors that I raised. And with the safe use, the whole focus is on wearing PPE. As long as you wear your PPE, the pesticide is safe, which of course is a problem in low and middle income countries. Sorrow referred to how many workers do not wear their PPE. And that's across the board in many low and middle income countries. They're not available, they're uncomfortable, uh, or the wrong equipment is, is uh, given to people. And access to training is, is limited in many countries. So what happens again is that the burden of the health risk prevention really resides with the end user. Andrea, so given the, are you coming yes. towards the end? Thank you, Michael. I'm nearly done. So Fabulous. Thank given you. the complexity with um, ensuring um, the 
prevention of pesticide poisoning and excess information. Uh, it's really important to have a look at the hierarchy of control uh, and where the elimination of HHPs is key and really to place the right to comprehend uh, and the right to know at the administrative level where the focus is on the individual. Um, and just to sum up, the right to know is not enough to protect from exposures and prevent pesticide poisonings. We really need to legislate the right to comprehend. We need to shift the way the blame of pesticide poisonings, of misuse and ignorance um, away from end users. And the right to health is really linked to the right to not be exposed to hazardous pesticides. And as Cribs said, the right to not be poisoned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. That's a really nice talk. And also it brings a very interesting the point about misuse and how we should not be blaming the users. It's the circumstances in which these people use pesticides has absolutely nothing about their choices. And our last speaker today is my colleague, Leo Cheshieva. She was one of the founding directors of the center we work together in. She has over 20 years of work experience in human rights, public health and gender issues, often in very mis and underrepresented communities such as drug users. She's, um, she has a remarkable, <laughs> a diverse background of degrees, having done her undergraduate degree in Hungary, her PhD in the UK, and a law degree with honors in Russia. She has um, been working to design policy issues for the center for the last four or five years, and it really is leading on this human rights approach of how we address the problem of pesticides from a human rights perspective. And uh, I'm very pleased to have to be at her to finish off the session which she set up and she's designed. Thank you, Leah. Thank you very much, Michael, for this wonderful introduction. I'll just share my screen. Looks perfect. We can hear you and we can mm -hmm. see it. Okay, great. My pre thank you very much for the previous speakers for their very inspiring and very informative presentations. My presentation will bring us uh, back to the prevention of pesticide suicides and the human rights associated with it. So, uh, so over one uh, over seven hundred thousand annual global suicide happen. Um, in the world and out of those one third of uh, uh, suicides are due to pesticide self-poisoning. Shockingly estimated 110 to 160,000 deaths um, happen annually due to pesticide self-poisoning. And this is probably a significant underestimation because lots of uh, countries who have this problem do not have reliable data associated with pesticide poisoning and uh, suicides. And estimates show that this resulted in uh, over 14 million deaths since the beginning of the Green Revolution in 1960s. Um, so th this is happening uh, according to um, res what research shows that this is happening because uh, highly hazardous pesticides are widely available and accessible in law uh, in agricultural communities in low and middle income countries. 77% of all global suicides occur in low and middle income countries. And this is because case fatality of poisoning with uh, um, uh, hazardous uh, pesticides is much higher than case fatality of poisoning associated uh, with uh, prescription medicine, for example, which are used in high income countries. Here on this photograph, you can see um, um, white tablets looking quite innocent, but in reality, very deadly. For example, people who ingest aluminum phosphide tablets have a 70% uh, chance of dying compared to only half a percent of for people who ingest uh, prescription medicine. And this led to the fact that in many regions of Asia and the Caribbean, 40% or 50% of all suicides are due to highly hazardous pesticides. And as many people have, have pointed out during our previous talks, um, uh, there is, um, equality and human rights issues that associated with high exposure of agricultural communities in low income countries to pesticides. Uh, first, of course, they're very easily available. Um, as Baskut mentioned, um, low and middle income countries use more HHPs than high income countries because many HHPs have been banned in, uh, in the high income countries for domestic production. 
Uh, for example, according to the um, uh, information by the by public eye, in India in 2015, 59% of all pesticide sales were of uh, highly hazardous pesticides, as opposed to only 11% in the United Kingdom. Um, and there are other issues that make people in um, alone middle income uh, countries more susceptible to pesticide po uh, poisoning and exposure. They may not have other uh, employment options. Poverty, climate change, gender inequality, uh, domestic violence, um, support for vulnerable groups and minorities may be lacking. Uh, public health services may not be available, mental health services, social support may not be available. And this uh, vulnerability has been um, recognized uh, by the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants, which have um, um, underlined that smallholder farmers and people living and working in rural areas are amongst the most vulnerable groups in the world. And this, also rec re this recognition underlines that special me measures need to be taken to lessen impact of uh, pesticides on rights and lives. So there are several characteristics associated with pesticide suicides that are important to underline here. First, they're very impulsive and they involve very low level of planning. So people report about thinking of ingesting pesticides just before 30 minutes before actually doing it. And we saw this very clearly in the first video that was shown before the session. There's a rare association with mental health. So if, um, if in the high income countries quite often there's association with mental health problems, in low income countries it, it is quite often a cry for help in a society where there's no other recourse uh, for many societal problems, for example. So and here we could mention uh, the difference between self-harm and uh, suicide or suicide attempt. So self-harm is an injury or harm to cope uh, or express uh, extreme emotional distress and internal turmoil. This is a definition according to the WHO. But usually there is no intent to kill uh, themselves uh, for people who engage in self-harm. However, uh, where highly hazardous pesticides are um, involved, some harm, self-harm can become deadly. Another interesting characteristic um, is that there is a rare mean substitution in, uh, in the case of pesticide suicide. Um, so people usually do not go and try to kill themselves with another uh, method. If um, um, suicide attempt is, is unsuccessful or doesn't happen, people usually go on to, uh, to continue their pro uh, uh, productive lives and do not engage in, in other means, uh, in, uh, to try to kill themselves with other means. And this all means that it's easy to prevent. Pesticide suicide are quite easy to prevent, prevent if means of suicide are not available readily at the moment of crisis. Uh, WHO um, underlines and highlights that means restriction is one of the most effective and cost, uh, cost effective means of suicide prevention. And in case of highly hazardous pesticides, this means a ban on highly hazardous pesticides. Research shows that this is not only effective for the prevention uh, for saving people's life, but also toxic, less toxic alternatives for the banned highly hazardous pesticides are available and the ban does not affect uh, agricultural yield. And this solution worked very well uh, for the situation in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka faced um, a very high raise, uh, rise in suicide rate after the introduction of highly hazardous pesticides in everyday life. Um, and um, uh, on the slide, you can see the suicide rate was uh, very low, about five um, cases per 100,000 population. And uh, during the 80s, uh, it increased dramatically to 57 for 57 incidents for 100,000 population. But after the government became concerned and um, uh, highly hazardous pesticides started, started being banned in Sri Lanka in 1980s, um, suicide rate has decreased. Unfortunately, it was very soon replaced with other highly hazardous pesticides. But after uh, all class one and class two WO toxicity um, pesticides were banned, the, the suicide rate decreased by 70% which saved estimated 93,000 lives. And this was done for quite a very low cost of $50 per life. So this is a very uh, good example of um, how pesticide bans work 
uh, for saving lives and saving health of people, of course. So here I would like to talk a little bit about the legal status of uh, suicide in, in, in the world. Uh, so all countries uh, understandably have a, uh, an interest in pre uh, preventing suicide and saving uh, the lives of, the, of their citizens. Suicide has been uh, viewed as a crime against uh, society, a community, God and the state uh, throughout history. And as a result, it was decriminalized in many countries in, um, in the 18th and 19th century. It was decriminalized in Europe in the 19th century when the understanding that criminalization doesn't really work and does not prevent uh, suicide, uh, suicide um, uh, in increase in suicide rate. Um, so uh, suicide was decriminalized uh, in Europe and in, in many other countries. However, in, in the UK, in England and Wales, it was uh, decriminalized much later in 1961. And this late decriminalization impacted um, uh, other countries that adopted common law system and other countries that were part of the common Commonwealth. So in many countries, um, such as Canada, United States, um, uh, suicide was decriminalized much later and some countries still uh, retain criminalization of suicide. So 25 countries right now criminalize uh, suicide. However, uh, research shows that this is a not good um, preventative measure because it only pushes uh, the problem underground, prevents countries from adopting um, reliable and effective suicide response, and also prevents a collection of reliable data. It also enforces stigma and uh, uh, marginalization of suicide survivors. Among many rights that are impacted by the um, uh, high uh, rates of pesticide self-poisoning and suicides, the right to life, of course, is, is the most uh, prominent here. I will not go through all the articles in the international human rights law that um, uh, entrench the right to life, but I would like to mention that the majority of countries in the world uh, entrench have uh, the right to life in their constitutions and other legislation. Um, general comment number 36 was adopted by uh, the Human Rights uh, Committee um, and is an explanation, a detailization um, uh, to, the, uh, to all the countries that um, ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights on how to implement and enforce Article 6, which protects the right to life. And this um, general comment uh, has specifically um, mentioned that, that states should take adequate measures to prevent suicides, uh, especially among individuals in particular vulnerable situations. And here a clear distinction needs to be drawn between a physician assisted suicide and uh, people in vulnerable situations. States, um, there's a number of, st of, of states that allow physician assisted suicide, but only in strictly defined circumstances and only for people who suffer from unbearable pain or have no um, uh, painful illness and have debilitating prospects in their illness and, and, and uh, have no um, chance of um, uh, curing the illness. In the, in the situation of uh, vulnerable uh, individuals that we're discussing, uh, there is no uh, long-standing desire to die, usually, as I mentioned before, so a clear distinction needs to be drawn between these two issues. Talking um, more about the um, uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the general, um, uh, general comment to uh, explain the duties of the state, there is a duty to protect the right to life, and it, it does include um, uh, the obligation for the state to take all appropriate measures, including positive measures, in order to protect the right to life from all reasonably foreseeable threats. And people in the situation of vulnerability um, need special measures of protection. For those of you who want to uh, have direct um, uh, references to uh, the articles uh, that, that we're discussing here, uh, we will later post uh, a, a paper that we wrote on this subject with all the direct um, articles and uh, references. So HHP ban is the most effective way to protect the right to life. And um, 
the state interpreting the general comment and the international covenant on civil and political rights uh, action need to be taken uh, to uh, restrict the wide availability of HHPs in rural communities, thus protecting uh, people's uh, right to life. And the industry has also an obligation to prevent and minimize the adverse effects of pesticides throughout phasing out HHPs that cannot be used safely. And this is also kind of um, echoing what uh, Andrea mentioned in her talk about the safe use of pesticides and misuse of pesticides. There are a set of other obligations that are involved here in addition to the obligation to protect um, the right to life. Those are uh, state obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill. I will not um, talk in uh, um, detail about all this um, obligations. Uh, those include avoid the, state, the, the fact that states need to avoid encouraging pesticide use, eliminate tax incentive, re refrain from uh, marketing uh, unsafe products and uh, so on. And also an obligation obligations to enact uh, uh, national mental health and suicide prevention strategies. Um, other rights um, that are implicated in the high availability of pesticides for suicide and self-poisoning, of course, are the right to health and uh, the right to healthy environment, non-discrimination, equality, the children's rights, of course, that are impacted and that we have heard about already from other speakers. Um, in conclusion, I would just like to um, underline that uh, phasing out a highly hazardous pesticide and enforcing uh, a regulatory framework grounded in human rights and based approach is the most effective way to prevent uh, pesticide poisoning and suicide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we're coming to a point now, we're just trying to decide, we're gonna go straight to the panel session. So what we have now is the four panel members who are left over are going to be um, talking, responding to questions, but I hope we're having a discussion across the group. This is not gonna be a single question to a single person. Um, what I'd be grateful for if the four speakers could turn their videos on now. When we finish the panel, we then have a film called Veronica, which is about the human rights of children affected by highly hazardous pesticides. It's a new film. It hasn't been shown before. So you will all get the chance to see it um, after the panel session. So if the four speakers could all turn your videos on, please. Uh, That's good, perfect. So thank you all very much. So the first question I'm gonna ask, and I think we'll ask Andrea the first, you're the first one on my screen. And then if each of you can come up with your own answers and then we can blend them together. So all the panelists have talked about the need of a human rights based approach to pesticide use. So fundamentally, what needs to be done now to formalize a human rights based approach in pesticide management? How can we do something globally now, which will have impact. Andrea, please start off. Thanks, Michael. Um, so for me, obviously, it needs to be in legislation. Uh, I think the, the big thing, particularly in low and middle income countries, is the burden of proof of whether a pesticide actually causes poisoning or health effects is always resting with the governments at the moment. Uh, and the burden of proof needs to really shift. But in order to have a human rights based approach, you need to have it in legislation. That needs to be very clear. The other thing is many low and middle income countries need guidance on how to do that. How do you do a rights based approach and, and get it into your legislation? And what we're seeing at the moment is that there's resistance. Um, resistance from many industries that a rights-based approach be uh, put in guidance documents and in guidance. So I, for me, that's very important. So I would say those are uh, two very key issues, uh, legislation and, and guidance. Thanks. And you're talking there very much at the national level. We have to support nations to do their own legislation. And then so, Marcos, mm. would you like to have a go, please? 
Sure, thanks. And, and thanks also to my fellow panelists for such interesting and insightful presentations. Uh, I would uh, compliment and add to what um, Andrea has uh, said and, uh, and point out that a rights-based approach will put people in vulnerable situations center stage and will look at reality from that vantage point. What is it that, uh, that people in the fields need? What is it that children that are exposed to pesticides need? Women, uh, migrant workers. Looking at reality from that vantage point begins to then um, roll out uh, or help us identify the range of measures that uh, need to be adopted. Uh, and as Andrew was mentioning, those exist in various levels. Uh, and at the national level, she articulated that quite eloquently at the global level i think this also the, the situation also needs to be uh, evaluated against uh, what uh, what scientists are, are warning on the toxification of the planet the the the, the planetary boundaries on, on chemicals and, and waste so the 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 change in trajectory um, and so that that's where changes in paradigm at the global level in addition to specific instruments are are, are needed I think uh, Leah spoke very eloquently about the need to phase out uh, highly hazardous pesticides. That's a measure that uh, that has been called for previously. It is uh, it is something that the international community is yet to design a, a viable work plan and a, and a pathway to achieve that. But it is the kind of example of uh, of a measure that begins to take on. The, uh, the, the substitution of hazardous substances for non-toxic uh, substances. And that, uh, I would uh, point out, is a, is a key element of, a, of the human rights-based approach as well, when seen from the perspective of those people in vulnerable situations. Thank you. So just one thing to, to point out here, that there was an action plan on highly hazardous pesticides, which was written to remove all highly hazardous pesticides initially from the world and then from agriculture only by 2030. And unfortunately that's now been put aside and is not, no longer moving forward at the moment through the FAO. So there was an attempt to try to do that simple thing of the highly hazardous pesticides being removed from agriculture. And unfortunately that's come to a standstill at the moment. Askat, please. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I wasn't aware that that has come to a standstill. That's that's unfortunate. Um, I guess from from my perspective, it all it all starts with prevention and prevention of use. Um, I didn't say this in my presentation, but the the institute that I'm with now, the Toxics Use Reduction Institute, uh, has for over thirty years worked to eliminate the the use of of toxic chemicals uh, across a range of different industries and sectors. Uh, including in some cases uh, agriculture but to a limited extent and uh, our, our belief is that you know the the best way to to avoid the harms uh, that in, inevitably result is through the elimination and and safer substitution with safer alternatives sometimes chemical alternatives sometimes non-chemical alternatives um, historically we have a very very poor track record of assessing and predicting exposure scenarios such as, for example, uh, regulators have a, a difficult time uh, predicting that uh, migrant workers will be sleeping in greenhouses, for example, where pesticides are being applied. That doesn't factor into risk assessments. Um, and, and so we, we need to be cognizant, I think, of the fact that we can't predict exposure as well as we would need in order to protect those that are most vulnerable. Uh, especially when it comes to children, the risks can't be quantified. And so the best approach is really to just systematically eliminate uh, highly hazardous pesticides from being used in the first place. And I think that's, that's the crux of a human rights-based approach. And, and certainly uh, part of that also includes accountability and other principles uh, that are part of the human rights system. But I, I truly believe that prevention is, is the, the heart of it. Thank you very much. Leah, how would you like to, do you want to bring anything together or come up with your ideas? Well, I just, um, I would like to reflect on something. So 
one of the most important documents related to pesticide management is the code on international code on pesticide management. So I'm just wondering how uh, the code of pesticide management could be interpreted or read um, um, to include more uh, human rights friendly approach to prevention and mitigation of pesticide poisoning. This is one of the documents that uh, many uh, national legislation um, and policies use in the countries to um, prevent exposure, mitigate exposure, mm -hmm. and to uh, have guidance to the Ministry of, of Agriculture and Farmers on how to use pesticides uh, with less risk. So I wonder, and maybe I, I would invite other speakers on the panel to reflect on this. How the code does the code need? Does the code have enough um, um, possibilities to interpret it uh, with the human rights based approach? And my answer would be yes. I think it does have specific um, uh, clauses, specific ideas within the code that um, has uh, that mentions mitigation, prevention, and um, uh, wants to reduce health uh, and uh, environment risk. Uh, would interpretation of the code and infusing it with a more human rights-based approach be useful uh, to uh, prevent and mitigate um, uh, harmful risk to health and lives? Thank you. So does anyone want to respond to that or do, do any of you disagree with each other? That'd be kind of more fun. Is there anything you'd like to disagree with a bit or, you know, or want to embellish or improve or build on? Uh, well, I can and jump in. <laughs> um, I agree. <laughs> so oh I'm not going to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think, um, so the code of conduct is basically best practice. And it, it outlines the responsibilities of, of three key stakeholders. So uh, government, industry, and civil society. And the idea then is that you have these guidance documents that are developed uh, linked to the different articles. And you know, it's true, the code does need a bit of updating and I think will be updated and one could you know, make very sure that a rights-based approach is brought into the update. But I think what's key is all the guidance documents coming out, that there's um, a preface that all guidance uh, to do with pesticides linked to the code is based on a human rights based approach. And I think that if, if that's advocated enough, you know, would be a big step for showing countries then, you know, so if you're talking about aerial application or if you're looking at a pesticide labeling guideline, if it's all based on a human rights approach and countries know then how to action that in their national legislation is really important. But I think what uh, people struggle with is how do you um, turn the concepts of a human rights based approach into legislation? What does the text look like? How, how can you actually implement it? And I think that's, that's what countries need, particularly low and middle income countries. Thanks. Well, we have three lawyers on this panel. Uh, maybe we can move on or we can... Mark, oh, hi, Marcos. You don't need to raise your hand. Just go ahead. Mm, thank all group, you, all thank you uh, Michael. Uh, uh, just to react uh, uh, um, on a couple of points, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Code of Conduct uh, has been updated several times now, and, uh, and so in, in a way it's a living document and uh, it may well be time for explicit human rights language to make it into the, into the document. But it is also a voluntary document, and so uh, its limitations as a voluntary document become ostensible when we're talking about uh, the, uh, the problems uh, of uh, highly hazardous pesticides and and that's where the uh, the global plan of action was a there was a lot of attention to see whether it could deliver on that global ban but now that there's a, a, a yet another delay uh, there's been more than a decade now of uh, delays on this issue since um, HHPs uh, were identified as posing a, a global concern and so there's there's 
there's the question of whether the, the code as a voluntary document is, is really worth the time to invest in, in inserting human rights language, which could also then become a, a boilerplate token language without any meaningful implementation. Um, so I'm pointing out risks, uh, not that this is uh, meaningless, but uh, there is that risk. Now, perhaps as Andreas mentioned, uh, having a guide on implementation of a rights-based approach to the code could be, uh, could be useful in, in, in overcoming or in addressing those, those risks. But there seems to be a, a more fundamental point, which is that um, the vision underlying the code is, is that of, uh, of minimizing uh, harm or risks for that matter. And, and I would wholeheartedly agree with, uh, with Bashkut that that's not enough, that prevention is the key. And, and so to move from, from minimizing a uh, paradigm where inevitably there will be harm, people will be left behind and hurt, and that's incompatible with the human rights-based approach. Moving from that to uh, actual prevention, where uh, the right to a healthy environment, the right to life, the right to health, the right to live in a non-toxic environment are made a reality for everyone. That, it seems to be still in terms of the vision underlying the document, uh, a, a bridge um, that needs to be crossed. Thanks. Thank you, Marcos. Vasco, do you want to say a couple of things before we move on to some other questions? Uh, no, I, I generally agree. I, I'm actually, in fact, I, I agree with everything that was just said, but um, uh, just to maybe also throw out the idea that there may be opportunities for synergies with the ILO and its Convention on Agriculture, Agricultural Workers and, and other instruments. Uh, for example, if the ILO were, were to uh, effectively implement right to, the right to safe and healthy work as a fundamental right and principle of the institution, that may create avenues for better implementation of the code to get past the, the weaknesses of it being voluntary. But um, anyway, yeah, we can move on though. Thank you. Um, you don't really wanna move on from such an interesting subject, but there's a, a few questions here, which I'm gonna answer because I think I know the answer to them, but please um, jump in, don't bother with hands. Um, so the first question is from Gina Valderrama from the University of, University of the Philippines in Diliman. And she asked, has there ever been a cost analysis of using natural means of fertilizers and pesticides versus the harmful use of chemical pesticides for the present and future generalizations in terms of yield or harvest? And I think the simple thing to say at the moment is no. There's a huge amount of modeling going on about use of how agriculture should work, et cetera. But actually I learned a few weeks ago that pesticides have not been included in that modeling. It's felt to be too difficult. So the pests and pesticides are not included in that modeling. And I'm hoping to work with collaborators in Edinburgh to start putting in pesticides into those really sophisticated models that have now been done and start seeing what comes out of that. I mean, it's a really important question. What are, we don't have the data. When I've talked with agriculturalists, the idea of big scale randomized controlled trials is quite foreign. They kind of, the idea is you take a field with a pest and a pesticide and a crop and you use it, if it works, it works. There's no big picture. Do we fundamentally need pesticides in this environment, in this region? And so studies on that scale will start to answer questions like this. Without that data, it's gonna be quite difficult to actually answer these questions. But modeling will be quite, is, is important and we'll try to get pesticides included in those models about global agricultural yield. Um, I'm gonna take a really easy question now. I will come back to the group of us. So, um, Bank him from the Emmanuel Health Association in India, North India, says, um, we're all aware that policy change takes a long period of time. What will be the best approach to reducing the number of suicide cases, especially in rural settings in the Indian context? So again, I think I can answer that, is that pesticide suicides, <coughs> excuse me, are low, um, are many times a low intention form of suicide, that people don't wish to die, they die because of the hazards at hand, as Leah made the point. So actually, a removal of, pesticides, of highly hazardous pesticides, the acutely toxic ones from communities, will rapidly prevent many suicides. Unfortunately, life is stressful, and pesticides, so hanging suicides are much more difficult to prevent, and fundamental change in society is probably required, as long with good mental health. But if we want to rapidly 
prevent, reduce the number of suicides, bans of acutely toxic HHBs can have impact within a year, which is really very rare for most policies. So I'm now going to come back to one question here, which is addressed to you, uh, Baskut. But so the question is, what kind of research data will contribute to changing to this policy related on the double standards? You've talked about the double standards of, of high income countries banning a pesticide and exporting it. Do we need research to better articulate that point? Or is it fundamentally so obvious we just have to implement policy? Yeah, well, thanks. That's a it's an interesting question. Um, maybe just by way of background, I could refer to to one of the submissions that came out from the Rotterdam Convention's debate on whether to include Paraquat within Annex Three of that convention. And there, there was an an analysis that was submitted um, where it, it set uh, as the baseline of risk the the level of risk in the United Kingdom for the use of of Paraquat, where it was set as one. And then it did a comparison with the relative risk of using that pesticide paraquat in East Africa. And it came, depending on, on the particular uh, situation of weather and other factors, at a risk of, uh, I believe, between 1,500 and 2,500 times greater uh, of harm compared to the UK. And, and that, was, that was submitted to the Rotterdam Convention uh, proceedings, which uh, yet again failed to, to include Paraquat within Annex 3. Um, and, and I mention that just because I think the evidence is very clear. The evidence is present. Um, and, and there's really no reasonable way I think someone could, could argue that uh, the risks of using a, a substance like Paraquat uh, in uh, countries, uh, low and middle income countries, uh, is, is for some reason less than it is in, in using them in high income countries. And that, that's all to say basically that I think this is a political decision that we're facing and it's not something that we need additional data or information. Uh, this was a political decision to keep a loophole within regulations such as the Plant Protection Products Regulation and Biocides Regulation of the EU. Uh, to allow manufacturers to continue to externalize these impacts on low and middle income countries, predominantly vulnerable communities. So uh, I think it's a political solution that we need, not additional research and data. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a question from the NI NIMH in the States. So Dr. Hova, thank you for that question. Anybody else want to answer? Or shall we move on? Fine. So, um, next question. So this is a question addressed to Marcos, but I think everybody here. And it's a practical question. How can farmers and agricultural workers' rights be articulated in national laws and policies? I'm not sure that's an easy question. <laughs> The, the question may be easy, but the, the answer may be incredibly long uh, because of the, of the number of, uh, of layers that uh, would need to be peeled. Uh, but if, if, one, if one can uh, identify a couple elements, one is uh, starting with the constitution, uh, a clear affirmation of justiciable right, right um, to life, health and healthy environment. Can, can begin to go national in many instances in ways that are non-justiciable. Uh, they, they articulate uh, preferences for public policy or state duties for the conservation of, uh, of natural resources, but they don't entitle individuals or communities to seize courts in order to enforce this right. So that would be a first, a first layer. A second layer it would be on on the on the issues of um, precisely the, the participatory rights uh, that are uh, embedded in the right to a healthy environment that I spoke of earlier, uh, and that's information participation justice. If I could uh, stop for a moment on the issue of remedies and, and access to justice, in many countries, perhaps in most countries in the world, we still see legal systems that are. <laughs> 
anchored to uh, to notions of uh, of negligence, uh, whether it's civil law based on Roman law thousands of years ago, where in order to uh, be successful in court for damages for tort for for suffer harm, still need to prove that the, uh, the there was some level of negligence that needs to give way, I would argue, to a, a rights based uh, focused to the law on remedies and liabilities that looks at the position of those who suffer and the victims, and how can they, they be made whole. A number of countries are uh, experimenting with uh, what some call objective responsibility or strict liability, where the issue of negligence does not arise. Even then, questions of causation uh, are difficult, but they are more manageable than, uh, than questions of, of, of negligence. Then there's issues of, of burden of proof and dynamic burden of proof. So there's a lot that uh, countries should start doing in order to guarantee rights when it comes to, uh, to the issue of, of remedies. There's so much more that, that could, uh, could be said, for example, on, on the standard setting process and, and the notion, the notion of, of risk. Uh, so uh, risk uh, becoming a, a basis for action to act when in the presence of risk. But this has also meant that there's a, there's a bit of a conceptual trap because uh, uh, risk has meant that uh, there's nar a narrative of safe use or controlled use. And I think this came across very clearly in Andrea's presentation of, of the narrative of, of blame. When things do go wrong, as they will uh, uh, one time or another, uh, what is the position of the weakest party? The, this, this conceptual trap of, of risk uh, can also be seen as uh, in, in the chemical by chemical determination of, of risk. So this is a, this is a recipe for paralysis that uh, is intentional, of course, to keeping the status quo. Um, if we look at some figures, the UN Environment Programme estimates uh, about 350,000 chemicals out in the market, most of which have never been tested for risk assessments. And without those, then there's, uh, there's paralysis, there's no action. So somehow we need to, I think, uh, begin to think about laws on basis other than, than just risk. If there is risk, then certainly call for action, but there, there are other bases for national level legislation in order to enshrine the rights that we're talking about that, uh, that concern regulation of uh, pesticides as a class, uh, of uh, hazard-based uh, precautionary measures and other, and other measures. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it there in, in terms of, um, of some of the elements that come to mind in, in thinking about what, uh, what national legislation could look like in order to protect the rights in question. What I quite like to do before anyone else replies is actually add on another comment from Joseph Bukalasa, who was a pesticide registrar from Tanzania. He simply says that um, uh, the role of the government is to protect their citizens against harmful chemicals. He says, not sure whether many countries have done this in the developing world, but what's the experience of this high income in high income countries? So talking about what you've mentioned, uh, Marcos, in a way you could argue the European Union possibly has been more successful and is trying to begin a process of protecting its citizens at a more general level. Is that just purely about resources or is it about an attitudinal difference? And is it something that we can translate it to other countries, other regions? Not sure if anybody else wants to reply to that. Thank you, Basco. Well, <laughs> I can take a stab. Um, I think, you know, there, there are many examples of uh, successful interventions uh, from around the world that I think could be scaled up. Uh, one of those that I would put out there is the experience of Massachusetts with the Toxics Use Reduction Act, where we've uh, systematically included hazardous and highly hazardous chemicals within the scope of this legislation. It, it actually doesn't ban any of those substances, but what it does obligate companies to do is to report on their use and to craft a, a toxics use reduction plan. Um, and I think this, this approach uh, combined with an institute a scientific institute, a scientific body, um, a research arm as well. All of this has come together to 
to reduce uh, both pollution as well as toxic exposures amongst workers in Massachusetts, um, in, in some cases in quite dramatic fashion. And, and I think that that might be an approach that other jurisdictions could look to. Um, but certainly, again, it, it really does come down for many of the, the worst of the worst chemicals that are out there that have built up entrenched economies of scale to regulation. Uh, we need restrictions and bans to remove those chemicals and allow safer alternatives to compete and enter the marketplace. Thank you. Leah, your microphone's off. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. On the question of um, the farmers' rights, I, I would just like to add to what other speakers said that farmers' rights are human rights. So farmers, of course, have all the same rights as uh, as as any other person um, uh, who lives in the country, and they're entrenched in legislation. Um, Many countries, of course, do not have omnibus laws on farmers' rights. But here I would like to um, draw on uh, the importance of policies. There are policies that um, draw specific attention to, uh, to particular issues. There are health policies, there are mental health policies, there are policies on suicide prevention, uh, could be agricultural policy. And all these policies could also take uh, a human rights-based approach. Uh, of course, policies are not binding. They're not. Uh, they, they do not have justiciability. They do not. Um, they they just they soft law and they express the general um, idea, the general intention of the state to um, let's say move towards a more human rights based approach or to account more for farmers' rights, for example, if such rights will be um, would be uh, entrenched in some kind of policies. And an example of Sri Lanka here, I think, is interesting because Sri Lanka, together with their um, uh, pesticide bans that were um, um, uh, implemented by decree of the um, Ministry of Agriculture. They also implemented a suicide prevention strategy, which were which was specifically um, directed to pesticide suicide prevention. And they instituted a high level task force that also worked on um, kind of worked on bringing all legislation that exists existed in Sri Lanka, including pesticide policies, uh, so pesticide bans and. Um, try to direct it to on to pesticide suicide prevention. So I think this is another way of doing it in a country uh, which would consider um, banning pesticides or drawing more attention generally to um, uh, pesticide uh, poisoning and exposure prevention is just to start uh, by adopting a policy uh, on, on this issue. Thank you. I like your comment that farmers' rights are human rights. And fundamentally, if we can strengthen human rights worldwide, farmers will benefit, as will everybody else. So while we may have a focus on farming communities, actually, it's much more of a global human rights will, will it strengthen the, the ability to cope with chemicals. Just looking through the, the questions here, I think, um, so Dr. Sharma, I think we've answered your question um, more generally so far about the role of human rights in implementing right to health, so about putting through policy. Um, We've also addressed the question about what are, where are farm, farmers' rights listed. Uh, I'm going to answer. So, there's a, if there's no personal intention to die, should we name this pattern of behaviour differently, rather than using the word suicide? And you are absolutely right. My personal preference is to use self harm and fatal self harm. There's no indication of, of intention there. It is simply a description of a process that happens. But there's a huge debate about this, and it's. Uh, sometimes, and the, the World Health Organization counts suicides. And while you can argue that many of these people didn't have any intention to die, once they've died, it's very difficult to be absolutely certain about that. There are a few poisons that take two or three days to die, like paraquat, where you can interview the person and explore that, but you can't systematically understand overall. And because the World Health Organization and the SDGs count suicide, it's simple sometimes to use that word. While you're absolutely right, that it's not necessarily technically accurate, and maybe not always helpful. Um, I have one, we're getting to the last couple of questions now, we're coming towards the end. So how can due diligence be promoted amongst companies? Can we work with the ILO? How do we improve that aspect? How do we get companies to, to behave with due diligence about the, calm, the, the 
toxicity of their chemicals they produce and they use. Andrea, you haven't said anything for a little while. Do you want to say something? You can easily say no, go away. <laughs> You've thrown the, the, the ball in my court. <laughs> um, well, perhaps I can make a comment first that I had wanted to make before responding and that maybe it'll link up to it is so, you know, a lot of the work I do is on low and middle income countries and particularly in Africa and in Southern Africa. And one of the big challenges that is faced by the government is corporate capture. Uh, and corporate capture takes different forms. Uh, you have small technical staff who are involved with legislating and regulating pesticides. And the lure of the money of joining uh, the industry is very high. So you have quite a revolving door of movement of people going from being regulators to the industry, so then having inside um, knowledge with regulation. Uh, you have a lot of uh, corporate capture in relation to policies that are stopped, uh, legislation that's pulled, um, bills that never go through uh, because somebody's been paid off or, or something's happened. So the question then of you know, due diligence of the industry um, is, is a difficult one in low and middle income countries. And I think the, the one thing is, um, well, it, it's, it's legislation, you know, you, you really the needing to follow legislation, but not being part of the regulatory process. So um, following the regulation, but not being part of making the decisions for what the regulation should be. Uh, and that's so why you're saying we can't rely on companies necessarily to follow what we consider a human rights approach but actually it's fundamental to national legislative assemblies coming up with a legislation which enforces good behavior well it's it's i guess the question is that a contradiction in terms you know what what is the industry's objective to make profits in in many cases and can um the objective of making profits uh work with the objective of firstly putting human rights in place and not poisoning people. So that that's a question I throw back. You know, I'm not Fine. sure. <laughs> Are you you were going? Have you finished off your answer? You said you're going to say something first and then build into your other answer. Do you think have you? Completed? Yes, my saying first was corporate capture. The, the, you know, I think it's something that we haven't raised in this discussion, and that corporate capture is very much uh, an issue in relation to human rights regulation, a human rights-based approach to pesticide management. Um, we really need to, you know, we've been talking about double standards, but we also need to talk about corporate capture. I think that's uh, also preventing as, as well. I do think one thing that comes out of that is the idea that in each country, the systems in place for pesticide regulation need support. Many of them are under-supported, under, you know, under finance, under supported, and actually, I must say, your your um, your setup at UCT and the course you give for regulators across Africa is really important and really pivotal about giving a certain number of these people who are really under resourced the strength, the groupings, the support to do the work they need. And I hope CPSB can also do the same thing to some extent, to having identified these people as being incredibly important people worldwide to deal with this human rights problem. We try and support them every way we can. So does anybody else want any of the other panelists like to give an answer? We can move on to a couple more questions. Fine. Ah, that's good. Uh, yeah, sorry. Just to maybe add that I think in, in agriculture, but then also in other sectors, I think it's important to look at the due diligence across the value chain, um, not just the chemical manufacturers, because in, in my experience, there's there are very few companies that actually in the chemical manufacturing space that do a robust human rights due diligence approach uh, or assessment, yet they know exactly what the problems are. It's not that they can't do it, they just don't want to do it. Um, and, and so I think the, the leverage points exist perhaps with uh, the downstream users, retailers, uh, other industries that may pay, play a more important role uh, in 
in instigating the type of change that we're we're seeking. Thank you. Marcos? My, yeah, if I could add a, a footnote to to these two comments is that uh, uh, the the um, the impetus for due diligence and the guidance uh, has uh, so far large from non-binding instruments from the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and its guidelines for multinational enterprises and also uh, from the UN Human Rights Council on, on guiding principles on, on business and human rights, uh, which are instruments that are flexible and broad and that try to capture uh, every sector and every company so that uh, due diligence can be tailored to the specifics of the actors in, in question. Uh, but but these instruments, they're showing also their limitations. This is in a way an analogy of what we were talking previously about the code of conduct as uh, non-binding instruments. And, and so the, the efforts underway in various uh, jurisdictions in setting up national legislation on, on due diligence, as well as the efforts at the Human Rights Council in negotiating a legally binding instrument on, on transnational corporations and other business enterprises and human rights, they speak of, of those challenges and, and due diligence <clears throat> issues are, are at the heart of those. At the, at the council, the negotiations on, on the treaty on transnational corporations is, um, is weakening by the minute. Uh, there's a, there's a scarce uh, in political support and, and so the ability of the council to deliver on that mandate is, is, is really in question, but the need for it is, uh, is perhaps today more pressing than ever given what, uh, what other panelists have elaborated on. Thank you. Thank you. So we have three questions left. I'm gonna call it at the end of those are those three questions. I'm gonna answer one and then we'll come to the other two. So the question from uh, Dr. Marquez or Hovas Marquez from NIMH, should since it will take time to change policy and political action, would supporting implementing community storage facilities to reduce access to pesticides also be a pathway to take? And I think from a human rights perspective, the answer is no, because that puts the impetus on the user to make sure that they use the pesticides properly, as has been pushed by industry, that if the person's not using it, if the person comes to harm, it's because they didn't lock the pesticide away. And I think that does send the wrong message because the, wrong, the, re, the right message is if we are using chemicals in these low income communities, they must be able to be used safely by people without the skills, the resources to use them as we would do in a high income country. And I think the problem with community, we've shown in our studies quite clearly and big scale, 53,000 households, that improving storage in households makes absolutely no difference. The problem with community centers is they're often in the center of the village and the farmers live on the outside. So they have to come in to the house, to the storage, find the other person with a key and then go out past their house again to their fields. We know that in the study in China, it didn't work. And a small study in India, it only 24% or 23% of households actually use the storage. So I think A, it's not likely to be an effective approach. Um, and there's been no data to show it is. And B, it just, it just goes against a human rights approach. This says it's the user's responsibility to use these pesticides safely, to lock them away. And that is the wrong message because these are very, very difficult compounds to use safely. So the second, the other two questions are, one is from Dr. Palika in Nepal. How do women's susceptibility to the effects of pesticides differ from men? So um, that's quite a technical question. Clearly there are, there were some parts of Dr. Shivana's, uh, uh, Dr. Shiva's talk, sorry, about if how women suffer from the use of pesticides. Briefly, you can argue about there are f different fat contents in women. Women have higher percentage of fat in their body and therefore store these long lasting pesticides much more than men do. Women uh, bear babies. It's, I mean, I don't mean to put women as being that's their sole role, but the part of their role is they carry babies. And so getting exposed to pesticides while they're pregnant or their, their eggs being affected results in complications in the child they bear. There are many different aspects to that. But that's just a small smidgen of the things. Um, the last question was, so besides regulations and bans, 
how would low income settings incentivize safer alternatives to HHPs in agriculture? And this is from Dr. Fong in Malaysia. Is more evidence based for cost effectiveness of safer alternatives needed to move the needle? So I'm going to answer that first, but I think that's a really interesting question. Is agricultural policy driven by randomized controlled trials, by hard objective evidence? And my discussion is that no, it isn't on a, on a, on a kind of a regional level, on a holistic approach of do we fund these pesticides? I've tried to do those studies. And I've been told by agriculturalists they wouldn't listen to the answers. So I'm not sure that that kind of answer is the question. I don't know what is. I think it maybe is much more at a policy level that we already know there are alternatives out there. We simply need to provide more information on them and more information on their cost. Do we need hardcore evidence to get that? I don't know. But I think we probably already have evidence. Uh, Sarojini would have been the perfect person to answer that question, but she's not here. Leah or and Andrea, would you have an answer to that? Yeah, so I, I think I have a slightly different approach to it is, you know, if you look at what is preventing the sort of a, a big shift to alternatives, um, often you'll hear the industry say, you know, that farmers don't want to take the risk, they're not sure about using alternatives. Uh, so I, I think one of the things that we underestimate is the role of the consumer uh, and these you know, large consumer uh, organizations play and retail companies. And so for example, in South Africa, a, a lot of our, uh, what we use changes because we export. We have a very big uh, export market and certain products just aren't accepted for export. Unfortunately, they end up on the local market um, if the residues are too high because there's no testing. That's another issue. Uh, but I do think, you know, the whole thing is about profit and you know, being able to make money and to produce the, the crop. And so if the consumers are demanding uh, more organic produce or less toxic chemicals it is a big way of moving to alternatives quickly. Um, I do also think that that there just sometimes needs to be people who are the master farmers who take risks and then they, you know, they set the stage for others. This is often in rural communities. If you can find people who are willing to take the risk of alternatives, uh, they often lead the way and then others will join. And farmer field schools can often help support those individuals to lead. Also in Andhra Pradesh at the moment, the government of Andhra Pradesh is trying to convert the whole of the state, which is 6 million farmers, 50 million people to organic agriculture within the next 10 years. So there's levels at the top level, and also, as you say, down the farm level, individual families and uh, communities taking on the risk of going to alternatives. There seems to be evidence there. We know that when these pesticides, HHPs in particular, are removed from agriculture, we don't see agricultural consequences. And I, yeah, the, the supermarket's leadership is actually very important as is the fair trade, the coffee, the bananas, trying to direct people away from using highly hazardous pesticides in that, in that production. Okay, I think we've come to an end. This has been a really, really interesting session. So thank you, four of you, very much indeed. I also want to thank the two people who spoke before, uh, Dr. Shiva and Sarojini, for the talk they gave. And I hope they're sleeping beautifully now as we continue to talk. What I would like to finish off with is a really very powerful film. It's a film that every time I watch it, I cry. This is a film about a young girl called Veronica who died at the age of 16 after a very small fight with her brother. And it's a talk, it's a film about her, what her families are going through. 20 years later, they still think about this daughter practically every day. And she died only because the community was using highly hazardous pesticides, which were completely untreatable and they were available in households in an unsafe fashion. Fundamentally, these, these pesticides are impossible to use safely in any way in the in a contaminated environment, it hurts farmers, and it hurts the children and the people who self-harm. So I believe the film we can get going now, I hope you can stay and watch it, and I hope it gives you some, some understanding of where this came from. It was produced by two of the people on this call, by Pooja Tasenanayake and Hishani Sotiraj Edelston, and I think it's a really powerful, moving film.
Every child shall have the right to such measures of protection as are required by his status as a minor. Article 24, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Kumari Hami and Dharmasiri live in the north central province of Sri Lanka. Twenty years ago, they lost their daughter Varunika to Gramoxone, a highly toxic chemical containing paraquat, often used in their farm. This weedicide has been responsible for many deaths in Sri Lanka and globally. Although there are no accurate estimates of the number of deaths from paraquat poisoning, Research by the Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention indicates that tens of thousands of adults and children have died due to intentional and unintentional poisoning by paraquat since the Green Revolution. Paraquat is one of the most common herbicides used today, but it can cause fatal poisoning when ingested or inhaled. It's primarily used to control weed and grass growth. She was just 16 years old. What started off as a little quarrel with her brother eventually killed Varunika. Thinking back to that time, Kumari Hami says that her daughter may have been afraid that she hurt her brother, felt ashamed or disappointed by her action, and drinking the pesticide was perhaps her way of showing remorse. Unfortunately for Varunika, the dose of Gramoxone was lethal. Just drinking a sip was enough. She died painfully the day after she drank it. Most of the people who take pesticides as self-harm, they don't want to die. They basically want to express their anger and uh, grief, and only about 10% of people have really uh, significant psychiatric disorders. Research shows that more than half of the people who harm themselves by drinking pesticides decided to do this less than 30 minutes before the act. <laughs> Self-harm is usually a spontaneous act, one that is not planned or thought through. The easy accessibility of pesticides and the high toxicity of the pesticide makes it a lethal combination in rural farming communities. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights stipulates that special measures ought to be taken to protect vulnerable people. It stresses that states need to adopt laws and other measures to protect life from all reasonably foreseeable threats. Children, that's anyone under the age of 18, are especially vulnerable and therefore need special measures of protection. <laughs> 
The Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 6, 1, states parties recognize that every child has the inherent right to life. 2. States parties shall ensure to the maximum extent possible the survival and development of the child. 3. All laws and policies should be adopted in the best interest of the child. Sadly, Varunika's right to life was not protected. It was violated by the easy access to a highly hazardous pesticide, which proved fatal to a child wanting to prove that she was innocent. These agricultural chemicals are commonly available and accessible in many farming communities in low and middle income countries where farmers are often unaware of the toxicity and the risks related to their use. It is therefore the duty of states to protect its people by being vigilant about the toxicity of pesticides that are sold and used. According to international human rights law, children ought to have rights to health and life. And it is the duty of the state to adapt all laws and policies in the best interests of the child. However, this was not the case for Varunika. Twenty years on, the family is still grappling with her loss. Her younger brother still suffers from mental health problems. As a child, he found it hard to attend school. And even now, as an adult, he struggles with daily activities. When she died, he was just 10 years old. <laughs> A child's right to life is violated when accidental or intentional pesticide poisoning leads to their death or interferes with their development. The easy access to highly hazardous pesticides has destroyed the health and well-being of this whole family and potentially had a profound impact on her young friends as well. According to international human rights law, children ought to have rights to health and life. And it is the duty of states to adapt all laws and policies in the best interest of the child. And the only effective way to do this is by banning highly hazardous pesticides and limiting its easy access. In the 1990s, Sri Lanka had one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Suicide deaths were 57 per 100,000 population. By banning paracot, monocrotophos and metamidophos, this number came down to 17 deaths per 100,000. A 70% reduction in all suicides and 93,000 lives saved. Currently in Sri Lanka, uh, the most uh, toxic uh, organophosphates and paracot is banned. Those were the main causes of uh, pesticide related deaths in Sri Lanka and uh, with the bans uh, pesticide related deaths have come down drastically more than 50 percent reduction in terms of mortality and also uh, burden to the hospitals have drastically come down. However Varunika and her family did not benefit from these bans. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
kamera tadi mata aku yang buka. Ada hitian yang tinggal aku duduk tis hayak peter, tis hayak tis sata peter. Kau hamari sena surat abi ya iri dana tiu na saung dana ni agak harus dana badah ada balik. Varunika's parents are still looking for answers, questioning themselves. Could they have stopped it? Was it their fault? Was it her karma? Did the companies that produced this pesticide know its strength? If they did, why did they sell it to farmers who had little information and resources? What they are left with are memories and remorse. Their daughter's life is gone because of the ease with which she was able to consume a highly hazardous pesticide. Mata pisu agi had me aite. Mona kan dek. Dakin dah bar, dakin lah mai kata kor bar nu kote ya agi pain wa mat. Eh sudu gawu mai dekan ohi anu kote ya agi pain wa. In vulnerable agricultural communities, it is the duty of the state to safeguard its people, particularly children, by banning and regulating the use of these pesticides. According to the Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention, regulating pesticides did not stop the ingestion of pesticides in impulsive self-harm acts but it did stop people from dying because the pesticides they used were no longer so dangerous. This suggests that deaths due to pesticide ingestion are preventable purely by bans and regulations. To protect vulnerable communities, particularly children, from impulsive acts of self-harm with pesticide ingestion, states need to ban these toxic substances. In addition, special measures need to be taken by the global community and national authorities to offer protection from these highly hazardous pesticides being used in rural agricultural communities. Thank you all very much for coming to the meeting today. I hope many of you found it of interest and um, we can find ways of working together globally to really make a difference on this point. That we can introduce human rights aspects into this form of pesticide regulation and try to prevent many of these deaths, much of, much of this environmental contamination. And um, have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much for coming. Please follow us, find out what we're doing, see our films on YouTube.